Welcome to the Appellate Division First Department. We have over eight hours of argument today. Almost everybody on the calendar has requested argument. So I'm going to ask that you only ask for the time that you absolutely need. We have reviewed your briefs and records and are familiar with your case. People versus Lucas, the appellant. Okay, I'm going to give you uh, four and one and four. Summers versus Port Authority for the appellant. Respondent? Five, two, and six. Isaiah is submitted. Alliance to End versus New York City Police Department for the appellant. Anybody here in that case? Alliance to End versus New York City Police Department? Okay, it's submitted. Pomponi versus A.O. Smith Water. Respondent? I'm going to give you five, one, and five. People versus Barber. For the appellant? Uh, for the respondent? 4 1 and 4. Overton versus Agami Group for the appellant? I'll give you five, one, and four. People versus Gonzalez is submitted. Upson versus Oliveira contracting for the appellant. Uh, respondent? I'll give you four, one, and four. Singh versus Wesco Insurance for the appellant. Respondent? I'm sorry, what? Five, one, and four. Quad Capital versus Obvi Inc. for the appellant. For the respondent. I'll give you six, one, and five. People versus Rosario for the appellant. That is submitted. People versus Hubbard for the appellant. Respondent? Six, one, and six. Thompson versus Rodney for the appellant. For the respondent? Five, two, and five. First, Mercury versus Nova Restoration for the appellant. Okay, respondents? I'm sorry, how much? You could do it when you come up. Okay, six, one, three, and five. Burnbaum versus Goldenberg for the appellant. Respondent? He said seven, seven and three. I'm going to give you five, one, and five. Harlington Realty versus Lawrence Plumbing for the appellate. Respondent? I'll give you five, one, and five. People versus Saldana for the appellate. Respondent? Four, one, and four. P 
People versus Garrett for the appellate. Submitted. Melendez versus Alliance Housing for the appellant. Respondent. Respondent. Five one and five. T R versus State of New York for the appellant. What? I'm sorry. You're for the respondent. Yes. And no one's here for the appellant. Do you wish to submit it? Yes. Okay, it's submitted. Okay, the first case is People versus Lucas. Appellant? Go ahead. Hello, good afternoon. May it please the court. My name is Travis Hill and I represent Mark Lucas. This court should exercise its discretionary power and reduce Mr. Lucas's term of post-release supervision to the minimum one and a half years in the interest of justice. As the nonviolent underlying crime was committed in the midst of difficult personal circumstances, including a decades-long struggle with drug addiction, mental health issues, and homelessness. And continued supervision is not necessary for the purposes of public safety and reintegration as it applies to Mr. Lucas. How can we be sure that continued PRS won't, be, won't protect the public more thoroughly than having no PRS? Well, if you look at the, the history of Mr. Lucas, there are a couple of reasons. One, uh, Mr. Lucas has been on parole and probation both in the past, so he's been under supervision, and he's experienced situations where he's been violated in the past. And so the, the supervision itself has not ensured that he would not be in violation of any issues, and it also is not necessary for public safety because this was a nonviolent crime, and Mr. Lucas has been able to maintain his sobriety. Uh, he's been uh, furthering his training and education, and he's also received new employment opportunities uh, since he's been released from prison. And the concern is that it, the supervision uh, would somehow be an impediment to him moving forward with his life instead of ensuring the safety and reintegration of Mr. Lucas. He, he's been successful so far, and for it to be extended, certainly to the maximum time period, would be uh, severe and unduly harsh in this situation. Why would it be severe and unduly harsh when it was the sentence given at the time? And you're asking us to reduce the interest of justice, but it was a plea bargain, so he agreed to it. That's correct, but the, the plea bargain, if you look at it, he received a, a low number of years for the prison term. However, he received the maximum for post-release supervision. And that's the same amount of time for post-release supervision that he would have received post-trial or if he would not have had the mitigating factors that apply in, this, in his life, such as the, the, drug, the, the drug addiction and the homelessness and the mental health issues. And so uh, the facts are that it's unduly harsh and punitive because even without those factors, he would have received the same maximum post-release supervision. The minimum is much more appropriate for Mr. Lucas as he tries to move forward with his life and he's putting things back on track. I would hate for an overly punitive parole system to derail his progress. Uh, okay, so thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much. Good afternoon, Abigail Renard for The People. <clears throat> Defendant is primarily concerned here with the possibility of reincarceration following a technical violation. However, those concerns are, the broad policy concerns with that have been addressed by the Less Is More Act, which was passed in September of this past year. 
it goes into effect in March of 2020 and creates a pretty significant distinction between technical and non-technical violations. <clears throat> and it limits when someone can actually be reincarcerated, specifically um, for violating curfew, as an example, or drug and alcohol use that don't involve a DWI offense. Defendants cannot be reincarcerated for those types of violations. And that addresses a lot of defendants' concerns here. And more broadly, there's no incarceration allowed under this new legislation. What about the, the failure to report or uh, change your address? Are those still uh, violations or not? I'm sorry, I couldn't the hear you. Failure yet. to report or a change of address that's not. That one is also not, um, I think failure to report a change of address, I believe so. I would need to double check for sure. But failure to report a change in employment circumstances is also one that you can't be reincarcerated for. Um, so it, it really, on a broad level, deals with a lot of these concerns that would prevent defendant from moving forward with his life. And further, it you know, creates additional, a lot of just additional procedures that help defendants and keep a lot of the positive aspects of supervision without the unnecessarily punitive parts that defendant is concerned with. On a broader level though, supervision is absolutely appropriate for this defendant. He has a well-documented history of substance abuse and committing crimes in order to support his addiction. Um, he's committed several violent crimes. He has a history of parole and probation violations and ultimately supervision is in his best interest and, and, and really necessary um, for him to lead a law-abiding life. Um, if there are no further questions, we ask that you affirm the sentence. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very briefly, uh, Mr. Lucas's prior violent offenses occurred more than 20 years ago. Uh, since that time, if you look at his record, most of his convictions have been related to his uh, drug addiction and his struggles to maintain sobriety over the years. This is not just a matter of reincarceration. As you're well aware, the uh, parole system requires a number of restrictive uh, requirements that parolees follow during the course of their supervision, and that can have a, a detrimental impact on uh, educational opportunities, on employment opportunities, as Mr. Lucas moves his life forward. For those reasons, we ask that the court would lower the term of post-release supervision to the minimum. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Summers versus Port Authority. May it please the court. My name is David Rutherford. I represent the appellants, Port Authority of New York and New Jersey, and American Airlines. This case is uh, about an altercation which took place between the plaintiff and non-party Billy Miles, uh, who was not sued in this matter for unknown reasons. The plaintiff has sought to uh, hold Mr. Miles' employer, American Airlines, liable for this altercation, despite the fact that he was not working at the time. And they've sued the Port Authority because the Port Authority- So counsel, uh, how do we know that Mr. Miles wasn't working at the time, given the fact that we don't have any timesheets, we don't have his employment record, and uh, the affiant, Mr. Gallo, had nothing to do with uh, personnel. Well, we have his testimony, which, which is uncontroverted. I beg your pardon? We have his testimony, which is uncontroverted. And his testimony is that he lived in Detroit. He would commute during the week to JFK. He'd work a three-day shift continuously for 40 hours over three days. He finished his shift the night before. Because he didn't have a residence in New York, he slept in his car in the parking lot. None of that is controverted. Except, um, so, also, except that the plaintiff said that he was wearing his badge 
which would suggest that he was working because he would, shouldn't be wearing his badge when he wasn't working, correct? Well, um, no, not necessarily, Your Honor. He was, uh, first of all, he was not in his uniform. He was in regular street clothes. He had his badge. Now, the badge becomes important because the way that the hangar is set up, there's a, what we would say, a restricted part, which is where the mechanics work on the planes, and there is an unrestricted part. There's bathrooms in both the unrestricted part up front and in the restricted part. This bathroom where that was- Where is that described in the record? I don't recall that. Sure, it's in, uh, I believe it's 341 and 351 of the um, record, Your Honor. He's clear about, uh, particularly at 351, that he could not, the, when they had the altercation, he wanted to use the bathroom, and the um, plaintiff said, you can't use it because the floor is wet. Why don't you go through the turnstile into the restricted area and use that bathroom? And he said, I can't use it because I'm off duty. I'm not allowed to swipe my card and to get into that area. So thus, he was stuck at the, at the unrestricted public area. If he had been on duty, he could have just swept, swiped his card and gone to the restricted area. He didn't do that. That further buttresses his argument that he was off the clock at the time. Sir, could you discuss your, uh, the evidence that uh, you claim supports your prima facie showing with respect to the neg negligent hiring, retention, and supervision claim? Sure. Both the plaintiff and the defendant testified that there had never been any prior incidents between them. Between um, them? But they... Between them. The, um, the plaintiff also testified that there had been no prior incidences in, um, in uh, Hangar 10. Um, I'm sorry, the he, plaintiff didn't keep records about that, I assume. Um, well, the plaintiff's not, they're not alleging that, that there was any incidences prior in Hangar 10, which is where this took place. Now, she did complain that on prior incidences in the passenger terminals, not that there had been an assault, but that men would come in and use the bathroom and expose themselves. What as was the basis for Gallo's knowledge as to the security clearance that this employee went through? Well, Gallo has worked at the airport for decades. Gallo I'm is- I'm sorry, where does it say that in his affidavit? I didn't see anything in his affidavit that said how long he'd been working there. I thought it did, but he, I don't even see if, any, I, okay. if you could show it to me, I'd be very curious. Well, Anthony Gall, okay. Or, or his of, job descriptions and responsibilities. Uh, plaintiff testifies that Gallo was one of his three supervisors. He was a- You don't a, mean plaintiff, right? You mean Miles. I'm sorry. You don't mean plaintiff, you mean Miles, right? I meant to say Miles, my, my mistake. Miles testifies that Gallo was one of his three supervisors, what he terms as a level five supervisors in the record. So Gallo was one of three people that had um, that supervised his position. Now, his position is a fleet service clerk. He doesn't even work in Hangar 10. He works loading the planes. That's what Gallo is. I'm Gallo's sorry, what did you say Mr. Gallo's duty title is? I'm sorry? What did you say Mr. Gallo's title is? That's in his affidavit. I believe it's customer service representative. Okay. Okay, you're going to have a chance to rebuttal. Does anyone have any more questions they want to ask now first? Thank you. Go ahead. Good afternoon, Your Honors, and may it please the court. My name is Lauren Bryant, and I represent the plaintiff respondent in this case. We ask that this court affirm the lower court's denial of the defendant's motion for summary judgment on the ground that the defendant has not tendered any affirmative evidence. Let me ask you something. We, we have Miles' own testimony that he was not working on the day of the accident, of the altercation. Why isn't that a prima facie showing, which would then shift the burden to, um, to the plaintiff to rebut as to the fact that he was not working? The reason for that, Your Honor, is this. Mr. Miles is the uh, John Doe defendant, uh, the assailant uh, who assaulted the plaintiff in this case. The only witness 
produced by American Airlines was Mr. Miles. So statements made by Mr. Miles concerning the scope and nature of his employment, whether or not he was on the clock, as a witness for American Airlines is a self-serving statement by an interested party regarding matters within I mean, his any exclusive statement knowledge. someone says in a case about anything having to do with a case of their party are supposed to be disregarded? You can't make out a prima facie with a party's testimony? No, Your Honor. The difference comes here where it's for the purposes of this motion and for this case, no other witness has been produce, produced and there's no other corroborating evidence. Well, what other witness, other than Mr. Gallo, who does also put in his affidavit, would come forth to say he wasn't working that day? Who else would be able to testify that he was not working that day? Anyone employed by American Airlines with personal knowledge regarding Mr. Miles, the scope and nature of Mr. Miles' job duties and in the nature of his employment. And as your honors mentioned, Mr. Gallo was not that individual. Mr. Gallo, was, Mr. Gallo was a customer, customer manager, supervisor, or let, customer. Let me ask you another question then. In terms of uh, Mr. Gallo's affidavit, he does make a statement in there about security check that all employees are required to go through in order to get the badge and even be able to get into the hangar. Why isn't that sufficient to make a prima facie showing as to the security check that Miles went through in order to become an employee of American Airlines, which he's saying all American airline employees have to go through that security check. So, Your Honor, this goes back to, and we think the lower court correctly held in this regard, that Mr. Gallo has not explained the basis of his personal knowledge. He hasn't described his job duties. He hasn't described um, what part of his employment allows him to know this about well, background what, checks. What, what about... What would it be about his employment that would give him the knowledge about that every employer goes through a background check versus someone who wouldn't have that knowledge? Well, uh, Your Honor, if Mr. Gallo stated in his affidavit, as he's required to do under the law, the, the basis for his personal knowledge, so for example, if Mr. Gallo said, I have worked at American Airlines for X number of years, um, I am fully familiar with the hiring process, the training process, the supervision process. Um, this is how it is. And, and Why fact, wouldn't someone who's the manager on duty for customer operations be familiar with security checks for employees? What about that title would make him unfamiliar with whether or not American employee airlines have to have a security check? Well, herein lies the issue, Your Honor. It's not up to us to speculate about that. It's the defendant's job as the summary judgment movement to present that evidence to the court and make out their prima facie burden. And this is all questions of fact for the jury to determine, to determine the credibility of Mr. Miles, a self-interested, I'm sorry, an interested party making self-serving statements. You can't statements. make out a summary judge, you can't make out a prima facie summary judgment motion based on the testimony of a party to the litigation, that that, that cannot be considered as a prima facie on a summary judgment? May, I see that my time's almost up, may I just respond? Yes. Uh, we're, no, Your Honor, we're not, con we're not contending that at all. Certainly a, a party to the case, uh, a party on behalf of the defendants can make such statements. However, in this case, in the absence of any corroborating evidence, timesheets, an affidavit from someone with personal knowledge, a basis for that knowledge, um, employment records, pay stubs, anything of that nature. Let me ask you, there's been, this, I, I know that the plaintiff uh, or, or the movement has a prima facie, but there's been discovery in this case. I mean, it's, this is not a new case. Has anything come forward in your discovery of the timesheets, et cetera, that, that in any way refute uh, that he was not working on the day of the incident? Uh, Your Honor, two things in that regard. I'm, I've only been retained as appellate counsel, so I'm only aware of the record that has been e the evidence in e-file on NYSIF and the evidence in the record. But second, this court has specifically held time and again that the defendant cannot meet their evidentiary burden by pointing to a lack of evidence in the record or gaps in the plaintiff's proof. I was just curious. I, I knew that that's I'm not, not aware, no, Your Honor. I'm not aware of any other witnesses that have come forward on behalf of either Port Authority or American Airlines, aside from Mr. Miles. Um, and to that end, Your Honor, I would just stress again that Port Authority has not put forward any testimony or any witness affidavit uh, regarding the issues of vicarious liability, um, negligent hiring, training, and supervision, uh, the premises liability. Let me liability. ask you a question about that, because there are clearly a line of cases from the First Department and the Court of Appeals that for scope of employment liability, it has to be in furtherance of the employee's business, somehow carrying out the employee's interest. How is getting into an assault with someone who works in the bathroom any way connected to 
furthering the employer, American Airlines business, or their business interests? Well, Your Honor, I would, I would submit that, again, that's something for us to speculate about, but, it, but it, the, the lack of evidence. What situation can an unprovoked assault on someone in the bathroom, because you're not allowed to come and be in the furtherance of American Airlines business? Your Honor, it, the, if, the, if Mr. Miles was working at the time of the incident, the fact of the matter is that we don't know the nature and scope of his employment. Um, and so you're saying it might have been part of his business duty to go into a bathroom and get into a fight with somebody? No, but if he were on duty and um, he, were, he were doing something in the course of his employment um, with his employer, that we just don't know what the scope of his employment is. We to only the have his testimony. Be part of the scope of your employment? He might have been taking a bathroom break. He may have been required to go do something in the bathroom. Um, certainly, even if we don't, even if we take vicariously vicarious liability off the table, we still have the negligent hiring, training, and supervision uh, okay. claims. Is there any other questions before? OK, thank you very much. Thank you. Just a couple of quick points, Your Honor. I would point out that um, the, plaintiff, the plaintiff respondent admits in their brief that he worked for the uh, that um, Mr. Miles worked for American Airlines. He doesn't work for the Port Authority. That's uncontroverted. As far as the prima facie case, we're not pointing to gaps in any testimony. That we have established a prima facie case through Mr. Miles. Whether Mr. Miles is interested or not, and I would submit to your honors that he has no interest in whether American Airlines is held high, liable. His interest is whether he assaulted or didn't assault the plaintiff. Sir, would you agree? Oh, oh, yeah. Sir, would you agree that for the purposes of the negligent hiring, retention, and supervision claim, you would have to demonstrate as the summary judgment movement through evidence in admissible form that you didn't know or have reason to know of a, of a violent propensity on the, uh, held by Mr. Miles? Absolutely not, because he wasn't working at the time. If he was working at the time, then that's an issue. But because he wasn't working, we never get to negligent hiring. If I commit something in my neighborhood wore, at home, he wore a badge my, that my employer can't be, I'm He sorry. wore a badge that day, didn't he? He wore an, uh, he an American his, Airlines. He had his identification. That doesn't mean he's working. In fact, the only testimony that allows in this him case, access, though, in places where you and I could not tread. No. That's ignoring his specific testimony, which is he did not swipe the card because he was not allowed to access that. He never stepped in a secure area that day. And he specifically says in the record, I didn't because I wasn't working. This never would have happened if he could have accessed the areas where he worked. He would have swiped the card, he would have went to the bathroom in the restricted area, and it would have all been over. I'm going to ask you something different. Um, what does the record say about the um, background checks that were conducted by American Airlines of Mr. Miles? Well, Mr. Gallo says that all the employees are uh, put through a background check, and Mr. Miles... How does he know that? Because he is his direct supervisor, and that's in the record at page 340. He's the direct supervisor of this man. If he doesn't know, nobody knows. Thank Any you. other questions? Thank you very much. Pomponi versus A.O. Smith Water. Good afternoon, Your Honors, and may it please the court. My name is Justin Reinhardt, and I represent American Built Right, Inc., the manufacturer of Amtico uh, vinyl asbestos floor tile. Now, American Built Right has appealed denial of its motion for summary judgment in the Pompone case. Built Right moved for summary judgment based on causation, that its product, vinyl asbestos floor tile, did not and could not have caused Mr. Pompone's lung cancer. 
Council, let me ask you a, a procedural type question. As you might be aware, uh, we have now placed two of these similar type of cases on the enacted calendar uh, until the Court of Appeals decides uh, the case before, which addresses some of these identical issues. What is your position as to whether this case should also be placed on the enacted calendar um, while we're waiting for that determination from the Court of Appeals? Uh, well, Your Honor, the, the, the case pending in front of the, the Court of Appeals, I believe, is, is styled Nemeth. Um, and that case is, is very distinct from this case um, in the, the disease at issue, uh, the product at issue, uh, and even the asbestos fiber type at issue. Um, so given that these, these causation motions boil down to a question of foundation, the foundation in that case is going to be different. The, the science that supports causation is going to be different um, than in this case here. Now here, the trial court found that American Built Right did in fact make its prima facie case that its product could not cause lung cancer and okay, did so not let's cause... Let's talk about that because there's two aspects, obviously, general causation and specific causation. As to general causation, assuming that you did make your prima facie, why wouldn't Dr. Ginsburg's report which stated that all types of asbestos, including crisps, crisps I can never pronounce it, crystal, uh, cause lung cancer, and further described studies showing asbestos is released by the cutting and installing of these kind of vinyl floor tiles. Why wouldn't that be sufficient to raise an issue of that? Well, that's not even at issue here, Your Honor. The question here is whether asbestos, um, chrysotile specifically, as admitted from floor tile, whether that can cause lung cancer. So isn't that what I just was just talking about? Isn't the general causation whether chrysotile can cause uh, lung cancer, and if, if it can, can the chrysotile that's released when you cut tiles cause lung cancer? Yes, that that's would be the... General causation, right? That would be general causation. So isn't that specific... the testimony that Dr. Ginsburg exactly testified as to? That is not. What, what Dr. Ginsburg says, uh, and I'll quote, uh, the record on appeal, page 997, there's overwhelming and incontrovertible scientific evidence that asbestos causes lung cancer, and chrysotile has been independently found to cause lung cancer. And he provides 20 some odd citations to support that. But the court can ignore all that because that is not in dispute. Dr. Ginsburg failed to show that the amount of chrysotile as potentially released from floor tile can cause lung aren't cancer. You, aren't you mixing up specific causation and general causation? Isn't that the question for specific causation, whether enough has been released in a specific case to actually cause the disease that happened in that particular case? No, Your Honor, because general, and causa general causation and specific causation go hand in hand. Right, but if that, to... if that, why isn't what we're talking about now specific causation, that enough asbestos was released by the cutting of tiles that this particular plaintiff was exposed to, which was sufficient to cause the disease in this case. Why isn't that specific causation? Well, that would be specific causation, but general causation, you'd first have to show generally what level of chrysotile can cause disease and that floor tile can reach that level and then compare that evidence to what Mr. Pompone did. And there's That sounds like specific causation, what you're saying. Well, the second part is the specific causation. So I, I, I think, I, Your Honor, if I, if I could quote this court in Juni, uh, the court said, the fact that asbestos or chrysotile has been linked to mesothelioma is not enough. A causation expert must still establish that the plaintiff was exposed to sufficient levels from the defendant's products to have caused the disease. And that's specific causation. Right, but if you have to show that for the plaintiff, it, you have to first establish what level of chrysotile causes the disease and that the product can reach that level. Okay, you'll have rebuttal time. Thank you, Your Honor. Counsel, I have a question before you begin. Yes, Your Honor. Uh, didn't Dr. Ginsburg indicate that medical literature establishes that there is no safe minimal level of exposure and therefore the amount is not an issue? Uh, well, uh, 
Dr. Ginsburg did testify that NIOSH studies uh, uh, indicated that there's no safe level of exposure. However, at the same time, Dr. Ginsburg uh, showed at one, page 1,000 of the record that EPA studies, which he relied on, uh, showed that floor tile installation uh, released more than 1.016 fibers per cc, which is well above the OSHA um, uh, ultra-hazardous risk uh, level. And he also showed that in other tests, which he relied on in satisfaction of the Parker standard, he relied on other studies uh, of um, people uh, being uh, of exposures in similar work, uh, showing that uh, installation of the floor tile, which is a high asbestos content product, Antico's floor tile is, uh, released fibers at 0.26 fibers per centimeter, and uh, in another study, 0.27, all of that above the OSHA uh, ultra-hazardous levels. So uh, then, so that in your view, it boils down to a battle of the experts at trial? Well, um, yes, Your Honor, but recently in um, a case called Pistone versus Amtico, in which Amtico in another department uh, was afforded a grant of summary judgment, the appellate division in May uh, at 194 AD 3rd, 1085, reversed that and, uh, and um, uh, decreed summary judgment and denied summary judgment, saying that the experts' conflicting interpretations of the underlying studies and the literature presented a credibility issue. Summary judgment is not appropriate as to this defendant. What is your view as far as our placing this case on the inactive calendar pending a resolution in Nemeth? Oh, I kind of, um, I kind of in assumed or intuited that that's what had been going on with the uh, previous two uh, cases we argued here uh, about eight months ago, and it's it's okay with me. I think it's a little uh, a little different in that uh, this is um, a high asbestos content product. Uh, uh, purposefully installed by the defendant in its product, and uh, the um, case before the Court of Appeals is a contamination case. It, it's in a different footing, different sorts of expert uh, evidence and that sort of thing. I also think it's different because in this case, I would, you know, I don't expect the court to conclude that there's, uh, that the defendant didn't meet its prima facie burden, but I, I believe they didn't uh, because if you look, for instance, uh, Dr. Geyer, the pathologist, the only medical expert, testifies solely on the basis of the uh, I, industrial hygienist Spencer's fiber release study. And if you look at page um, 491 of the record and 495 of the record, those are photographs showing the guy doing the study and on its face showing that this is not an acceptable methodology because the 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 research, the uh, Mr. Spencer, I think, is depicted in those photographs, is not wearing a mask. He's simply doing, he's simply cutting tile that he bought at a at a store that Amtico supplied to him without any mask, which on its face is not accepted methodology, and um, in a room that's 4,000 cubic feet large, uh, and uh, and and um, coming out with an incredibly low. Uh, a fiber per cc uh, amount outcome that's totally contradicted as uh, the trial court stated by um, Dr. Ginsburg's studies, which are multiples. Um, actually, um, the EPA study shows fiber release 2,300 times higher than what Spencer found in his um, study. And that's the only study somehow that, that the defendants um, one medical causation expert relied on, why didn't that uh, pathologist rely on other um, credible studies like the EPA study or the other studies that are out there regarding the installation of floor tile instead of just the uh, IH hired by this one defendant? Thank you very much. Thank you, Your Honor. Your Honors, I, I would just like to note that there is no battle of the experts here. This is a, a question of foundation. And Dr. Ginsburg, the highest number 
of potential fiber release from floor tile that he gives in his report is 0 0.96 fiber cc's. And that number is for uh, a person that actually was installing tile. Mr. Pompone never installed tile. He just walked by some other guys installing tile. Dr. Ginsburg never shows what that level would be, somebody that was 10 to 15 feet away, what that fiber cc concentration would be. But let's take that 0 0.96 for a second and just assume that that was a legitimate number here. Dr. Ginsburg says, does indeed say there is no safe level, but that talks in terms of risk, not causation. He never defines a causative level. And Sean R. and Cornell both specifically said, the Court of Appeals said that that has to be defined. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honors. People versus Barber. May it please the court, my name is Isaac Glassman from White and & Case, and in conjunction with the Center for Appellate Litigation, I am pro bono counsel for Mr. Barber. The sole issue on appeal is whether my client's conviction is against the weight of the evidence where the firearm that was recovered was swabbed for DNA in three locations, and each swab came back with the DNA of someone other than my client. Well, that's not the only evidence in this case, however. Is that correct? That's correct. There was police officer testimony that purported to identify Mr. Barber as the man who discarded the firearm. Wasn't there also a, a citizen witness? Who... There was a citizen witness with an unobstructed view, but he couldn't identify Mr. Barber at trial as the man who discarded the firearm. All he, he could said testify. That, that was the person who. He said the citizen witness said, uh, alerted the police to um, his observation that the gun was thrown by the person being chased by the police. So isn't it a one plus one two equals two situation? I don't believe so, Your Honor, because first of all, the citizen witness couldn't identify Mr. Barber as the individual in court. And with respect to the police identification at the outset, there were numerous inconsistencies that rendered it quite suspect. Well, didn't they follow him? They did follow him, but again, there were inconsistencies in that regard as well. Officer Gilly testified that upon seeing the man whom he believed what? to be Mr. Barb, I'm, I'm sorry. No, I, I interrupted you, I'm sorry. He, Officer Gilly testified that upon seeing the man, he never lost sight of him, whereas his sergeant testified that they saw the man, they exited their vehicle, they lost sight of him, they had to walk the area for several minutes, and only then did they regain sight and a chase ensued. Who is in the best position to gauge the materiality of those inconsistencies? The, the jury or the five of us who didn't observe the demeanor and, and listen to the, the testimony of the witnesses? Well, this court is vested with weight of the evidence review for situations exactly like this one where the jury struggled. And in this case, the first jury at the first trial couldn't reach a verdict. It was only on the second trial that my client was convicted. And so it's clear that the, the jury, excuse me, struggled with this case. And this is exactly the type of the case where this court should exercise its power of review to weigh the probative value of the conflicting evidence that was adduced at trial and vacate a verdict that wasn't consistent with the weight of the evidence. Sir, was there any indication that the second jury, the jury that rendered this verdict, that they, they struggled? Did they send any notes that would be indicative that they uh, that, that they were they grappled with this case uh, in the manner that the first jury may have? I believe they did send notes, Your Honor. I don't know if any of those notes suggested that they were grappling specifically with reaching a verdict, but we do have a first jury that could not reach a verdict based on the same set of facts. Thank you very much.
<clears throat> Good afternoon, Your Honors. Nathan Scher for the people. May it please the court. Uh, I'd like to start talking about the uh, DNA testimony that uh, opposing counsel brought up. Uh, this court has held that a verdict is not against the weight of the evidence where there is an absence of DNA on a firearm. Uh, excuse me, there is an absence of the defendant's DNA on a firearm that is explained. And that's exactly what happened here. The people's expert uh, testified that the uh, swabbing of a firearm most of the time uh, yields insufficient DNA to create a DNA profile. And so uh, while we touch items and leave our DNA on them, the expert made clear that there's not always enough DNA on those items left by an individual uh, to make a DNA profile. But the absence of the DNA does have to go into the, the soup, right? About weight of the evidence, we can't look at a, at, a, at a prior case to see if that would dictate the outcome in this one. With weight of the evidence, it's going to be a sui generis inquiry about the quality of the evidence in each case. And so the absence of DNA, a match here, that, you know, that, that is a factor we have to consider, right, in, in undertaking weight of the evidence analysis? Sure, Your Honor, but it is not the defining factor. And I think as uh, some of Your Honors had alluded to, there was, <clears throat> excuse me, other ample evidence in this case uh, that made clear that defendant was the individual that Officer Gilly uh, witnessed throw the firearm into the bush. Uh, the two officers were actively searching for uh, defendant. They had a wanted poster uh, that had um, a photograph of him depicting him with uh, glasses and uh, braids. And when they found defendant on the staircase, he had glasses and braids. Uh, Officer O'Brien had actually met with defendant face to face a few months prior uh, for about 10, excuse me, 15 to 20 minutes. And of course, when Officer Gilly was chasing after the defendant, uh, defendant turned to throw the firearm into the bush and Officer Gilly was again able to see uh, defendant's face. To what extent should the fact that the first jur jury hung uh, factor into our analysis as to weight of the evidence on this verdict? Um, I, I don't think that the, the outcome of the first jury uh, should, should have an impact on this. This jury saw the evidence presented in front of it and made, uh, as Your Honor mentioned, credibility determinations that are uh, granted great deference and were able to, to review the facts on their own and come out to their determination. And uh, as far as I'm aware, there, there was no indication that they uh, grappled with that decision. Um, so if, if there are no further questions. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Just two very brief points, Your Honors. Um, with respect to the identification, Officer O'Brien testified that he couldn't recall exactly when he had previously met Mr. Barber. It could have been 2016 or 2017. So it's entirely possible that his 15-minute encounter with my client preceded this chase by at least half a year, if not more. Um, and Officer Gilly had never met my client before. He based his entire identification on a photograph. With respect to the cases that opposing counsel cites about the absence of DNA evidence, here we have the presence of DNA evidence, and it's DNA belonging to someone other than my client. Well, that just means that that person at one point held the gun. Correct. And when you're weighing the most likely inference, I would submit that the most likely inference to be drawn from the DNA evidence is that someone other than my client discarded the firearm. How so? It doesn't tell you... The DNA doesn't tell you when, when the sample uh, was put onto the, the gun, when the gun was held by that person. It, it does not tell you when exactly the gun was held. But again, there was DNA on all three locations from someone. It doesn't tell you anything about the DNA other than the, identif the identification of the donor. That's correct, Your Honor. But again, trying to draw the most likely inference from the evidence at trial, I would submit that the most likely inference is that someone other than my client was holding and discarded the firearm. I don't understand that. I don't understand why that's an in, the most likely inference. Well, because the my only inference that I can make from that is that at some point that other person held the gun. That's correct, Your Honor. At some point, some other person did in fact hold that gun, and there was no DNA evidence suggesting that my client held that gun. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Overton versus Agami Group. And thank you very much for your pro bono service. You're the appellant, right? Yeah. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Um, my name is Renee Eubanks, and I represent the appellant, Cheryl Overton. We're here today because of a motion to dismiss on 312.11 grounds, and our position is that the lower court should not have dismissed Ms. Overton's label or claims, especially at this early stage of the litigation. We believe well-established principles were not followed by the lower court, specifically the standard of review, the case law precedent set by the Court of Appeals, the plain language of the statutes, which counsel, is clear and you, unambiguous. Counsel, can you explain to me why your client would be entitled to proceed under Labor Law 191, given that she earned, she was hired to be the president, and she received a salary of $300,000 per year? It seems to me that would all preclude her that would all place her within the exception of Labor Law 191 for persons employed in a bona fide executive capacity whose earnings are in excess of $900 a week. Why isn't that claim barred by that? Because actually, Your Honor, the Department of Labor itself interprets who is a bona fide executive and says that there is a multi-part test, all of which must be satisfied in order to find that someone is a bona fide executive. In uh, Ms. Overton's affidavit, she posed that she was not, did not have the power to hire and fire, and that her vote to hire and fire did not carry particular weight. But you that, would agree that she was denominated the president of the company, and she earned over $300,000 a year, right? That's correct. But she was not, within the definition of a bona fide executive, a bona fide executive. So counsel, and just one, if I may counsel, sure. so why does the complaint state at paragraph 46 that the plaintiff worked in the executive role of president for approximately 21 months? Right, she worked in the executive role, that's correct, that's what she, her role is, but whether or not someone is a bona fide executive is defined by what the she, Department of Labor. That's her language, that's, that's the plaintiff's language the plaintiff could have said, I worked in the role of president. I could have been framed in any other way, but the word executive is chosen to define what the president of a company is, right? Well, two things. One, when she says the word executive, she is not thinking of the legal definition of bona fide executive but at that time. It's a complaint. It's a legal document. But that's, the, the language in the statute is what controls. Without, with, but with respect to that, that is only one part of her claim. She has an, also has a 191 claim with respect to the work that she says that she did for the other defendants, defendant, specifically defendant Cusp. She has not been uh, named an executive of defendant Cusp and that has not said that she's an uh, executive of defendant Cusp. So to that extent, those claims would still be survived under 191 and there would still be an issue under the defendant Nagami as to whether she is a bona fide executive under that multi-part test. Ma'am, do you recall if that particular argument that you just discussed regarding the uh, labor law 191 and her work for Cusp and Dream, do you recall if that uh, claim was asserted before the, the motion court? Yes, it was asserted that she had done work for multiple um, defendants uh, and that she was only asserting that she was, an ex they were only asserting that she was an executive of one of those defendants and that was defendant Agami. Didn't she actually say in her complaint that she was doing her work, that work, during her tenure as president of Agami? She was doing that work, but they're set, they, the 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 play. Uh, but if she's doing the work in her ten in her tenure as president. Why isn't that part of her work that would be precluded by Labor Law 191? Uh, because actually, the CEO of the company runs the other companies, and the CEO is just has the authority to tell the employees of one company to do work for the other company. They're not going to say, no, I don't work for that company. They're just going to do it because she, the 
CEO is the boss, but that doesn't make Ms. Overton an employee of that company because she's asked to do work for the CEO's other companies. And so we believe that whatever she did on behalf of those companies, that she should have been compensated for the benefit to those companies, not to the benefit of Igami, because that wasn't what the work was related to. It was work for those specific entities. Okay, you'll have some time on rebuttal. Thanks. Okay, thank you. If it please the court, on behalf of respondents, I'm Jane Jacobs. I'd like to make two points to the court. The first is to just point out how narrow the issues before you are. There are three labor law claims in this case. One for equity, one for pay for use of uh, Ms. Overton's likeness on the website following her termination, and one for notice of uh, the date of her termination, the cessation of her benefits. All three of those, which are the only claims before you, are against Igami only. So whether she was working for CUSP as part of her work for Igami, or whether she was working for Dream Ventures is utterly irrelevant because her compensation at that time, the claim she's making is for payment by Igami. The other issue that I'd like to address to you briefly, I think the only real issue in this case is the retroactivity of the amendment to section 193. There is a presumption Let that- Let me ask you, do we get to the retroactivity if it, we accept your argument that these claims wouldn't be wages anyway? No, you would not get to it, you're correct. Go ahead and address it. I just wanna make sure that you're not saying that we need to get to that if we agree with you that no. these are not wages. No, I agree, I agree. Um, but as to 193 and retroactivity, there is a strong presumption that legislation is to be uh, uh, applied prospectively only. In this case, the statute on its face says it is effective immediately. It does not say this is to be applied retroactively, which is the single strongest indicia that the legislature would, would have wanted it to be applied retroactively. It doesn't say that, and this court in Daisel has said that that's inimicable, it's incompatible with the idea that, it's, that there's retroactive applicability. Well, let me uh, ask you the follow-up question. Why wouldn't they, if, if it did apply retroactively, why wouldn't, uh, these claims be wages under the statute. I'm sorry, why wouldn't Why the wouldn't these claims be wages under the statute? Well, a couple of reasons. First of all, under Wilhelmina, the court, this court has said that the use of a likeness, while it may be compensable, is not wages. As to equity, um, the, because the, the equity grant is not dependent on her efforts and her achievements, it is not considered wages. It, it may well be something that's owed to her as part of a contract claim, but it's not wages because it's not predicated on how well she is able to, uh, to, to do her duties, in, in essence. How do you respond to your friend's uh, assertion that the Department of Labor has defined bona fide executives in a certain manner and there are certain elements that have to be satisfied and that one or more of those elements wasn't satisfied here? Well, first, I don't know what that element might be because, quite frankly, somebody as been pointed out, who's making a base wage of $300,000, whose contract calls for the president, who is in charge of every aspect of the operations, and who in her own affidavit against this, this motion says, I was the tiebreaker in the executive leadership team. I was hired to be the dispositive vote. How that person is not an executive, frankly, is beyond me. I think I recall her saying that one of the Department of Labor's, not criteria, but I think she characterized it as elements, was that the person had to have the, to be a bona fide executive, had to have the power to hire and fire. And her client, I don't think there's any dispute, didn't have that power here. Well, no, I think there, if we were at trial, there would certainly be a dispute. But the executive leadership team, according to plaintiff, is the one who had the ability to hire and fire. If that's the case, she was a tiebreaker in that group. She had, and two of the, at least two of the other people on that committee reported directly to her. So to say that she didn't have that, that power is, is frankly specious. Thank you very much. Thank you. Actually, Your Honor, a couple of things with regard to the, the multi-part test. The multi-part test is the multi-part test. We cannot make it up. And it says that she has to have the power to hire and fire. 
In her affidavit, she actually gave information that there was a candidate that she wanted to hire that worked to work for her, and that candidate was rejected. It also says that her vote to, in a hiring and firing has to have particular weight. If she is one of five people, her, vo her vote is one of five. It does not have particular weight. So is it your position that in order for somebody to be found to be a bona fide executive, they must satisfy each and every criteria in, in total and uniquely? Yes, that is what the Department of Labor expressly says when it gives the definition and the criteria. It says that you must meet all of the t categories of the test. Um, with regard to um, 193, very quickly. Um, Sorry, you're going to be out of time. Yes. Thank you very much. Upson versus Oliveira Contracting. Good afternoon. May it please the court. My name is Lauren Bristol, and I represent the defendant appellant, Oliveri Contracting. In this case, Metro Paving should have had its motion for summary judgment denied, um, both as to the plaintiff's claims and as to the claim for contractual indemnification, the cross-claim of Oliveri. Oh, counsel, I, Go ahead. I was kind of perplexed in, when I read the papers. One, because in this case, the uh, documentary evidence seems to establish that the subcontractor wasn't working, wasn't on the job until five days post-accident. Um, and two, because the co subcontractor, Metro, agreed to indemnify and hold harmless um, Oliveira um, only to the extent that the claim was based on Metro's acts, omissions, or negligence. So if you're on the job five days after the accident, um, how could you possibly be negligent or have committed an omission or engaged in a wrongful act? Well, here's where the issue of fact was raised, and that's why the summary judgment should have been denied. What we have is authenticated pictures that were authenticated by Ms. Upson herself and, uh, and her testimony and her affidavit. And when you look at those pictures, and everybody agrees that those pictures show a road that has been milled. It has very distinctive features. If we look at page 1198 and 1199, very distinctive features of a road that has been milled. And the problem is, is that if you say you didn't do the work until the 26th, how is it that on the 21st, the road looks like but this? Counsel, and that's I an issue. That the testimony about the pictures was, first of all, that they were taken after the accident. And second of all, that the purpose for which those pictures were introduced was the condition of the um, pavement that she actually fell on, not for the general condition of the road. So it seems to me the fact that it was milled is really irrelevant. And the question, the problem is, is that I didn't see, well, let me ask you a different way. Is there anything that you have other than the photographs to support your claim that Metro was working before the incident, before the accident occurred? The photographs and the testimony of the plaintiff herself, because what she does is she identifies. She doesn't know who Metro was. She doesn't know who Metro is, okay. she doesn't know so who So apart is. from, so you don't have any other evidence that Metro was on the job before the accident occurred, other than the fact that you think that the photographs show that the road was milled and therefore Metro must have been on the job. Right, I don't think that. It, it clearly shows it in the photos and what happens in the milling process is it takes off two inches of, of the roadway and that's the manhole cover and the roadway part. What it is, is it's the jury Plaintiff that should decide. Know that the milling had anything to do with her accident, does she? She doesn't understand what milling is. So I don't know why, if she identifies that this is what the, the accident roadway looked like at the time, 
then this is what the roadway looked at the time. If we look at the pictures, as, as jurors will look at them, as the people who are involved with Metro and, and, and Oliveri, they know that this is milled roadway. It is Thank you. You have time for rebuttal. So, Council, why shouldn't we hold? Oh, I'm sorry, Should go let, ahead. Let, let sorry, 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 sorry. Yeah, let me go through that. May it please the court, Bob Vizza from Bartlett. I represent Metro Paving. Uh, Justice Gessmer, you have a question. So, why shouldn't we hold Metro in because the photograph showed the road as having been milled, which was within Metro's job description? Well, I'll go back to Justice Gessmer's comment. The plaintiff didn't say that milling is what caused her to fall. Looking at the photos, and there's many copies of these, I, I'm looking at 427, that was the, the uh, defendant's exhibit for the deposition. What's surrounding that manhole cover is a dug up area. It's not the striated, striped area. So I think milling is a red herring, but- So who performed that work? Sorry? Not the milling, but who performed that work immediately around the manhole cover? You said that it was, it was dug up. The, the only reasonable inference is that it was some of Oliveira's people Olivera's own witness, Mr. Dessa, gave two affidavits. The second one was in response to the plaintiff and mother's affidavit saying, hey, by the way, not only was this street dug up, and I fell because the area around that manhole cover, not the rest of the general condition of the street, but around that manhole cover was dug up. And Dessa said, oh, that's not from milling. That's in his second affidavit put in on the reply. So their own affidavits from Dessa and Sudico are saying, hey, the milling was done by Metro five days later. Couldn't have been them, couldn't have been from milling. And how do you take that position and back around and say, oh, there's a question of fact, we want to ignore our own or their own uh, experts in that regard. Um, the contract absolutely does have a negligence trigger, so we don't have any contractual obligation. There wouldn't be any common law contribution obligation if we have no liability to the plaintiff because Council, we have Council, no duty. One, we one were... quick question. So um, Metro submitted logs to show the dates on which it worked, and it, it had daily logs, um, the names of the journeymen who worked each day, and so on. Is there any documentation that shows that Metro was working on the date of the incident, which would be April 21st, 2018? No, so we have two sets of logs yes. th that show when we were working starting on the 26th, and then the other logs say no work before that, that we hadn't started yet. And it dovetails in with the proof upon which Oliveira relied in Dessa and Sudeco's affidavits that we didn't start until the, the 26th. So there's no question as to when we started. I think they were trying to create a question of fact as to when she fell. And viewed in the light most favorable to the plaintiff, she fell on the 21st. And she fell because the road was dug up. And the court properly relied, the trial court properly relied upon the section of Oliveira's own records indicating all the other work they were doing, digging up, replacing sewers, strain grates, uh, sidewalk work and roadway work and putting in patches of asphalt and that photo, as much as it looks like part of it was milled, what's around that manhole cover is an area that was dug up with temporary asphalt and even the plaintiff testified that this was temporary. So I see nothing except we're lucky that the trial court didn't grab some low-hanging fruit about the question they tried to say, well, maybe it wasn't the way it was in the photo when you fell, but it really was. She cleared it up, she gave the affidavit that said she went back a day or two later and this was the condition of it. And her mother says the street was dug up. And Dessa says, hey, you know, when the news crew was there back in February, that the street Thank was you. dug up, not from milling. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our Court of Appeals has said in Silman versus 20th Century that if even there is a arguable or debatable issue of fact, summary judgment should be denied. The jury here needs to see 
This is what the photograph looked like. This is what the area looked like on the day of the accident. Either she's wrong about how the accident scene looked, which is very possible that she's just wrong. This is not the way it looked. The manhole didn't look that way. The roadway didn't look that way. But that's up for a jury to decide. But if the jury believes that this is what it looked like on the day of the accident, then Metro did this work, and now they're out of the case. It's too early for this to be decided this way. A jury needed to decide whether or not this was milled roadway. Did they create this condition? And that, that is how the motion for summary judgment should have been denied. And on the, the indemnification claim, if a jury does decide that the milled roadway. Counsel, did you, so um, correct me if I'm wrong, but Oliveira sub, subcontracted a portion of its contract with the city to Metro, right? Correct. They were the only milling contractor. So did you submit any invoices? For example, uh, is, have we missed something in the record that show invoices for work performed uh, before April 26, 2018, for work performed on the date of the accident, April 21st, or work performed for before then? Do so we other, have that? Other than the contract itself, the contract was signed on the 17th. No, no, no. I, I didn't ask about the, the contract signing date. I said, do you have invoices saying we did work, pay us? There was nothing in the record that showed that there was. Thank that you. Work. Yeah. Thank you. Thing versus Wesco Insurance. May it please the court, Kevin Buckley for Wesco Insurance Company, the appellant here. Uh, we asked the court overturn the trial court's uh, decision allowing the complaint to be amended and to grant Wesco's motion to dismiss. I don't think there's much uh, dispute about the original motion to dismiss. The original complaint places plaintiff's insurance claim clearly within the exclusion to the policy's coverage. It claimed that there was a collapse. The policy provides we do not cover collapse. So based on those pleadings alone, the motion to dismiss should have been granted. Now, going to the motion to amend, in response to the motion to dismiss, the plaintiff uh, asked the trial court to amend. And in the amendment, the plaintiff, rather than stating facts that would leave one to- Let, let, let uh, me ask you something. It's, it's the context that we're determining this is, is not even a motion to dismiss at this, this point. It's whether or not the amendment should have been allowed, which is even a lower, lower, lower standard than a motion to dismiss. So why, why, instead, why are you appealing the denial or the grant of the motion to amend as opposed to waiting and appealing either the motion to dismiss or motion for summary judgment or something? Because it's such a low standard that we have to look at. The plaintiff's not required to make out their claim. They're not required to submit any proof. They're not required to do very much. The standard's palpably insufficient. So applying that standard, why shouldn't we allow the amendment? Uh, I, Your Honor, I do understand that the standard is low, but there is a standard, and there has to be a standard. And there has to be a standard that provides my client with some notice as to what they did. And I'll say, with the amended complaint, if anyone can point to the date that my client actually breached the contract, then maybe it would provide notice. But you can't. And the reason you can't is because all my client was told was that there was a collapse. It was never told during the claim investigation that it was caused by these specific perils, which might trigger this additional coverage. Based on what it was told, it issued its coverage decision that there is no coverage here. After it issued its coverage decision, it asked the insured again, do you know what caused your collapse? It was told again in writing, in a sworn statement under oath. You're asking us to pass through the evidence now. You're, uh, but, in deciding that there's no merit to this amendment, you're asking us to pass through some of the evidence in this case, statements that were made, and the question is whether that's appropriate in the context of a motion to but, but, but actually what I'm asking you, Your Honor, is to look at the notice that we were given. What, what did Wesco Insurance Company do wrong? What date did it breach 
the insurance contract, and it, the complaint can't Well, isn't that you. whether or not they state a cause of action? Do they state a cause of action for coverage under the policy? You're rephrasing it as, was there a breach? But isn't the real issue in these type of cases is can they make an argument that there was coverage under the policy, that there was an, an exception or exclusion that applies so that there is coverage or not coverage? I, I think the, the minimum standard is that there has to be some factual allegation in the complaint rather than a mere recitation that one or more of these things in the contract may have happened to trigger coverage. That does not provide any notice. And, and I must add, Your Honor, this was extremely prejudicial to my client to attempt to amend this complaint years after the loss, after all the evidence was discarded. Uh, and so when, were they, when was Wesco first put on notice of the claim? Wesco, of, of the claim that the collapse was caused by one of the specified perils in the additional coverage collapse, only for the first time during the motion to amend the complaint. That was the very first time. It was put on notice of a general collapse from a mysterious cause uh, initially, and it had asked several times under oath with the assistance of counsel, what was the cause? And we were told every single time, I don't know, maybe it was rain, and that doesn't bring it within coverage. But didn't your client begin their uh, investigation within four days of the incident itself, as they stated in their disclaimer letter? It did begin the investigation, correct. It was told there was a collapse. It went out and attempted to uh, look at the evidence, and it asked the insured what caused the collapse, as is required under the conditions of the policy for them to tell us how the loss occurred, when it occurred, and we asked how the loss occurred. And we were told, we don't know. So if the insured says it does not know, it places it clearly within the exclusion. And there's nothing for Thank us you. You'll have time on rebuttal. Oh, thank you, Your Honor. Good afternoon, Your Honors. My name is Craig Blumberg. I represent the plaintiff respondent. Well, let me ask you a question. There's so many times in the record where the claim you now made has been contradicted by the testimony of your clients. Uh, for example, the testimony that was caused by wind and rain, which would not come under the exception, uh, and that they didn't know what caused the collapse. They made a number of statements which undermines the amendment they're now uh, attempting to make. Why well, should we allow this amendment to go forward under those well, circumstances? My client is a homeowner. He's not, they are not experts as far as what caused the collapse. Since these amendments, since these motions, there's been expert disclosure, and we have experts that say that the, what the cause of the collapse was. There's no way for a, uh, an insured to know that the collapse was caused by hidden decay, which is what our claim is, and that's based on expert testimony that will be offered at trial. This is a 3211 motion to dismiss for failure to state a cause of action. That's all this is. And, the, and, and in order to uh, meet the requirements, it, there has to be a contract, you have to claim breach, and that's what we did. I feel like I'm arguing a motion for summary judgment now, and that's not what we're here for. In fact, the initial motion to dismiss was to dismiss the initial complaint. We made a motion, uh, cross motion to amend the complaint based on evidence that we gathered on, a, on an, an expert information that we have, and we amended the complaint. I'm not even sure what mo what, what, what's being appealed here. They never made a motion to dismiss the amended complaint because it's a detailed complaint. This is not a motion for summary judgment. The, the, the lower court de denied their motion and granted my motion to amend the complaint based on the law as it relates to a 3211 motion. So the question of the cause of the loss is for experts to decide. And you can't hold a homeowner responsible when their building collapsed to say, oh, it was caused by hidden decay. They don't know what caused it. Well, sir, what about the point of, of prejudice? Because this is, I think, to answer your question, uh, we're reviewing the grant of the 3025 motion, which would entail uh, whether there was substantial prejudice to the party against whom that relief was was granted. So you heard your friend say that we were prejudiced because now, only after all of the building has been raised, um, the passage of time, 
Now they're asserting certain specific exceptions to the exclusion, and we are in a we our preparation of our defense is hindered because of that passage of time. Well, they, they could not have been prejudiced as the insurance company was there within days and did their own investigation, hired their own expert to inspect the building. And just because the insured did not have their own expert to say what the actual cause was doesn't mean they were prejudiced. They just took their position based on their initial inspection and their expert, and they didn't know what the cause was. And as an insurance company, their position is, well, we don't know what the cause is, so we're going to deny your claim. They did a detailed investigation of this claim. They did an examination under oath of the insureds, and there's, there's absolutely no prejudice to, to an insurance company if an insured, after they have to sue the insurance company, has to hire an expert to really dig in and find out what the cause of the loss was. There's no prejudice to the defendant insurance company in any way. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, I just want to take off from where my friend left off and when he said, then they have to sue the insurance company and then hire an expert to find out what the cause is. If they didn't know what the cause of the collapse is, that brings it back within the exclusion in the first place. If they knew what the cause of the loss of the collapse was, they should have told us as per the conditions of the policy so that we could have had an engineer look at that alleged evidence. Is it a rotted beam? Is it a decayed stud? What caused it? We, we can't be... Counsel, but yes. aren't you arguing at cross purposes? Because if you have an investigation, you have the ability to bring your own people on board to figure out what the cause of the collapse was and to determine whether it fell within one of the exclusions for coverage. Yeah, yes, Your Honor. Uh, it did fall within one of the exclusions. It's the collapse exclusion. It, it is the question of whether it, it comes out and goes into the additional coverage collapse, which all right. courts have said is the insured's right. burden to prove. Thank you very much. Quad Capital versus AbbVie, Inc. Good afternoon, Your Honors. May it please the court. Garth Spencer on behalf of the appellants. Uh, this court should reverse the decision of the Supreme Court granting dismissal and should remand for further proceedings. This case alleges claims for fraud against the defendant pharmaceutical company AbbVie on behalf of the appellant investors. I'm sure the court is familiar with the facts, so in the interest of time, I will forego summarizing them here. Why don't you start with the personal jurisdiction since that's the thres threshold issue we have to determine why there is personal jurisdiction in this case. Uh, gladly, Your Honor. <clears throat> uh, this court has personal jurisdiction over AbbVie pursuant to New York's long-arm statute in two independently sufficient ways, under CPLR 302A1 and also under subsection A3. Uh, furthermore, the requirements of due process and minimum contacts are satisfied well, here. Let me ask you about 302A1 because you have to show that there's a substantial relationship between the activities and the fraudulent misrepresentation and concealment claim. So what is that substantial relationship in this case? Uh, that substantial relationship is thoroughly documented in the record that we made and the 29 exhibits that we submitted in the motion court. Uh, Abdi knew that it needed its own shareholders and Shire's shareholders to vote in favor of the Shire merger. Uh, Abdi yeah, also you're, you're knew- not, You're not suing about the actual merger agreement, the terms of the merger agreement. Your, your suit is based on fraudulent misrepresentations. Weren't all those representations made outside of New York? Uh, that's right. They were made from Illinois, purposefully directed into New York in order to induce the reliance of New York investors on those false statements. Um, <clears throat> as I was saying, Abby knew that many of its largest shareholders were located in New York and needed those shareholders to vote in favor of the deal. 
As such, Abby purposely directed its false statements about the merger into New York um, and communicated with New York investors regarding the Shire deal, directing its statements into New York by phone, by written communications, and in in-person meetings conducted in New York. Uh, Abby analyzed <clears throat> the true tax-driven benefits of the deal in close consultation with New York bankers and lawyers. If you're talking, if you're talking about the investors, that sounds more like the CPLR 302A3, which is tortious act without the state causing injury within the state, because the, the, your claim is that the investors were injured by these fraudulent misrepresentations. Isn't that correct? That's correct, Your Honor. So that, that's a different standard than the, than the substantial relationship. That's where did the injury occur? Uh, that's correct, Your Honor. Where we did the injury occur? Um, <clears throat> we submit that jur jurisdiction is proper under subsection A1 and under A3. And for okay, purposes- but it sounded like your argument was veering towards A3 in terms of the shareholders. So, so let's address that. Where, where was the injury that, that you need in A3? Thank you, Your Honor. For purposes of subsection A3, um, appellant's injury was directly suffered here in New York. Um, appellants were directly injured in New York because they detrimentally relied on Abby's false statements in New York. As established by the uncontroverted affidavits. What about our CRT case, which says that you don't look where the financial damage occurred, you looked where the critical original events associated with the action took place? The, the, the CRT case does not control here for several reasons. First and foremost, it is factually distinguishable. Uh, there was almost no New York connection in the CRT case. Um, the plaintiffs were in the Cayman Islands. <clears throat> the defendant auditor was in the Cayman Islands. The misrepresentations related to um, <clears throat> uh, statements about a Cayman Islands hedge fund. Uh, there was practically no New York connection alleged. Uh, furthermore, um, CRT, well, perhaps using some broad language, should not be read as broadly as Abby suggests, because to do so would reduce subsection A3 to a nullity in the context of fraud claims. If we locate um, the location of injury at the exact same place where the false statements are made, there would never be subsection A3 jurisdiction in the context of a fraud claim. And that is an absurd result which should not obtain. Well, wouldn't it be if the fraud took place in New York, like if the statements were made in New York? Uh, that would not fall under subsection A3, which only relates <clears throat> to tortious acts occurring outside the state of New York. Uh, the CRT case is further distinguishable um, because it does not engage with this issue in any detail and because it arose on inapposite facts. The more apposite cases are the um, New York federal court decisions that we cite in our papers that directly engage with this question of where is the location of the injury and they uniformly locate that at the place of detrimental reliance in New York. So wouldn't we be, if we followed your approach, wouldn't we be overruling the language in CRT? Uh, no, we would not be because, I uh, apologize, Your Honor. We would not be overruling CRT because it arose on distinguishable facts and <clears throat> its language need, need not be read as broadly as Abby suggests. Um, so it can simply be distinguished, confined to its facts narrowly. Any more questions? Okay, you have time for rebuttal. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. May it please the court, Lamina Bowen of Kirkland and Ellis. With me is Andrew Rima, our co-counsel, who will be presenting argument today. We have to make a request, actually, counsel. I'm so apologies, Your Honor. It's a request to the court, which the court could deny. I probably will not deny, but you have to make the request. May he please present argument, Your Honor. I, um, I kind Requesting of request. that he be admitted pro hoc vici. Request that he be admitted pro hoc vici. Apologies, Your Honor. The motion's granted. Grant, thank you very much. <clears throat> Good afternoon. May it please the court, Andrew Rimey for AbbV. I want to start at the threshold question, personal jurisdiction and the CRT case. Uh, Mr. Uh, Spencer argued that if the court adopts uh, the holding in CRT, that then fraud cases uh, would never, uh, could never be brought in New York court when uh, the alleged fraud has occurred outside of New York. And that's just not the case. For example, if there was some kind of direct targeting of quad. If they, the 
the traders at Quad had communication with AbbVie or vice versa. And they could point to the record and show that Quad itself was being targeted uh, by AbbVie. That would be different. There might be an argument under A3, but here these are statements issued by AbbVie from Illinois to the world. They're attracting investors from New York, California, Alaska, the UK, Europe. Uh, the record is clear that the investor base that they were attracting is worldwide. On, on uh, 302A1, a substantial relationship question. The st substantial relationship has to be uh, with the acts that make up the claim. And here the acts are the statements that again were undisputably given from Illinois. There's no substantial relationship uh, with New York to Quad's claim. Your Honor, I want to briefly address uh, the race judicata argument. Uh, I, I, there's no dispute between the parties that Illinois law controls the application of race judicata uh, to the party's first case, which was dismissed at summary judgment by the Illinois court. The only way Quad escapes race judicata in this case, if there exists some anomaly in Illinois court that elevates a motion on the pleadings over one uh, from summary judgment, which Illinois courts call the put up or shut up moment. There is no such anomaly. Uh, in their briefs, Quad relies heavily on the Downing case. And the Downing case from the Illinois Supreme Court is about whether race judicata can be applied to a case that has a, has a different defendant than the first case. In the Lowe case from the Illinois Supreme Court that came out three years after the Downing case, the Illinois Supreme Court clarified Downing and said the fact that the defendants in the second case were different than the first case was, quote, a critical, unquote, part of the holding in Downing. And that critical fact distinguishes Downing from this case. In the Ryan case that came three years, or two years, I'm sorry, after the Downing case from the Illinois Supreme Court, the court affirmed race judicata dismissal in a case that was uh, dismissed at the motion to dismiss on the statute of limitations violation. The only difference from the Ryan case in this case is that the Ryan defendants styled their motion to uh, styled their motion as one of motion to dismiss early in the case, and Abvi styled its motion as one for summary judgment after fact discovery. And your honors. Uh, I think this gets a little bit lost in the briefing. The holding by the Illinois court was not just that Quad violated the statute of limitations. The holding was that Quad also brought, in whole or in part, non-cognizable claims under Illinois law. If the court isn't convinced that the dismissal on statute of limitations isn't on the merits, then it certainly uh, can find that the holding that at least part of their claims were non-cognizable was on the merits. Under Illinois law, race judicata applies to everything that was brought in the first case and everything that could be brought in the first case. So if you take out statute of limitations and you limit that holding to only the holder claim issue, you can still apply, apply race judicata. Even though that's not the claims that are before us now. Uh, Your Honor, they have pled holder claims in their complaint. They, ple they plead that uh, AbbVie allegedly induced to, uh, them to purchase and hold Shire securities. And finally, Your Honor, if the court isn't convinced on race judicata, uh, CPLR uh, uh, 3211A4 allows this court to affirm under New York law the first in time rule. Quad chose Illinois to resolve this dispute. We litigated it for two years in Illinois. It's still in the appellate courts in that state. Uh, and Illinois should be, the Illinois courts should resolve the dispute. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Your Honors, as to my friend's argument about direct targeting of uh, Quad as to CPLR 32, or 302A3, um, Abby targeted false statements at New York investors in general. That is firmly established in the record and our papers. Uh, there's no requirement to directly target the specific plaintiff. Abby cites no case establishing such, establishing such a requirement. And the uh, Court of Appeals Penguin case, in fact, counsels against such a requirement. As to CPLR 302A1, 
Uh, there was a very substantial relationship here between the appellant's claims and uh, Abby's purposeful New York activities. Abby directed its false statements at New York. It uh, tested its false messaging with New York investors, and it gained knowledge of its falsity of its statements in consultations with New York bankers and lawyers. As to race judicata, uh, Abby has no case saying that a summary judgment on statute of limitation grounds in Illinois gives rise to race judicata. Thank you very much. Thank you. People versus Hubbard. Good afternoon, Your Honors. Jan Holtz for Appellant Vernon Hubbard. There's no question here that Mr. Santiago engaged in juror misconduct. During deliberations, he went home and using a deer carcass, experimented in order to determine- this, this statement that he was using a deer carcass, is that consistent with the evidence that came out during the 33030 hearing? At the 33030 hearing, Mr. Santiago backtracked and said that he was merely using a piece of meat, but that just makes absolutely no sense. First of all, he's the one who said a deer carcass. Where on earth would defense counsel come up with a deer carcass? Second of all, it was consistent with his hobby of being a hunter because a hunter might have a deer carcass around. It just makes no sense that defense counsel, counsel would say it was a deer carcass if counsel, she hadn't been is, told. If you would kindly just tell me the, the page of the record where the deer carcass is mentioned by the... I'm sorry, I'm struggling to understand the question. Sorry. The, can you give me the page number in the record where the deer car carcass is referenced by the juror? The, it's not in the, the, the... The juror told defense counsel after the verdict that during deliberations he had gone home and experimented on a deer carcass. But isn't was, the issue, I'm sorry, no. isn't the issue what happened in the jury room? What he did in the jury room, right. not what he did at home, but what he did in the jury room. Isn't well, that, what they did in the jury. Isn't, isn't that what we have to look at? Well, but part of what we're looking at is what he was doing at home, the outside that he brought in, because he brought into the jury room the experiment, they all agreed that he told them about his experiment in his home. They recreated those experiments, except rather than meat or deer carcass, they experimented on each other. Now, so wouldn't this testimony actually help the defendant, though? If the juror, jurors believed what he was saying, his testimony was favorable to the defense position that it could not have been this defendant who committed the stabbing. His testimony wasn't even consistent with the evidence at the trial. He said he didn't believe any of the witnesses. He believed... I know, but you didn't answer my question, which is, if, if the jurors did believe anything he said, wouldn't that help the defendant? I, I'm not sure how it would help the defendant, because if you look at what he was saying, he was saying that based on his experimentation... Mr. Washington should have had defensive wounds, and he did not. Right, so he's saying the stabbing did not take place as the prosecutor was presenting it, which would be in favor of the defendant. Right, but that's... Ex it but, would help the defendant. But that's bringing in outside expertise that's now affecting the jury. We don't no, no, know. The question we have to look at, you know, is, is from that, is whether or not the juror turned himself into some kind of expert, whether he was an unsworn witness or whether he just used his everyday uh, experiences, perceptions, um, uh, common sense in evaluating the evidence. It's not what he did at home that we're worried about. It's what he did in the jury room. Yes, Your Honor, and what he did in the jury room was he brought into the jury room mock knives and then some sort of experimentation was going on. There was a description of, and they attacked him and stabbed him in you, the leg. You want to use the word experimentation, because that's like a magic word in these cases. But what he's really doing is demonstrating what he thinks happened. He's not experimenting. 
But your, but your Honor, he's demonstrating what he thought happened based on no evidence. I mean, it, he can't come in and say, I think this happened. It, this was That's right. He's not, he's not turning himself into some kind of unsworn witness. And that, that's, the criti that's a critical thing. But he's absolutely an unsworn witness because there was no witnesses that, there was one, excuse me, that said they saw the actual stabbing. His whole thing was, I don't believe these witnesses. I don't think it happened this way. But none of those witnesses testified to seeing the stabbing. A lot of inconsistencies about what kind of knives, how they were held, how they were swung. But only one witness said they saw the stabbing. So he's now acting as an investigator, and he's bringing into the jury room evidence based on his history as a hunter and his experimentation on a deer carcass to show the jurors, this is what I think happened. And what, was the, what was the defendant's main defense or defenses at trial? That, that he did not do it. There was the, nothing. He, okay. They didn't prove that he did it. So that he didn't do it. Okay, now, going back to the juror misconduct, there was a, a fact-finding hearing on the 30, uh, the 330-30 motion, right? Yes. Okay. What was it uh, that the, the motion court, the hearing court, credited there that occurred in the jury room with respect to this, this juror? What the court said was that the juror, the the court credited as his 330-30 hearing that he was merely slicing meat and that it caused him to think. Right, but that's what, that's what happened at the house. Now we're in the jury room, and he does some sort of whatever um, we want to call it, demonstration, uh, experiment. He and some other jurors now engage in some sort of conduct, and the, the, the court below made findings with respect to that. And what did the court find occurred in that jury room? Um, the court found, used the word demonstration, but didn't actually find any, make any findings as to exactly what happened, but simply said that it was not outside the ken of the average juror. But again, that was based on the um, slicing of the meat and thinking. The, the court's decision was based on he was merely thinking, and thinking is what they're allowed to do. So there was no harm. Can't there they do more than that, counsel? no misconduct. Counsel, can't jurors do more than that? Can't they also um, engage in a reenactment or a demonstration? Aren't jurors allowed to do that in the jury room so long as it's no more than the juror's application of everyday experiences, perceptions, and common sense? But exactly what a, a reenactment means that they're reenacting something they've been told. There's no evidence in this record of how the actual stabbing occurred. Thank you very much. May it please the court, Rafael Curbelo for respondent. Uh, during the trial, four witnesses, Darshana, Willoughby, on pages 119 and 122 through 123, and then Natasha Hill on pages 481 through 483, and Whitney McCorkle on page 516, they, they testified and, and demonstrated the manner in which the defendant wielded the knives, and two of them testified as to how he delivered the fatal blow. Now, Dashana Willoughby, she saw the stabbing, and she knew that the defendant stabbed someone, but she just didn't know who the victim was. Whereas uh, Tyanika Smith saw the defendant stab uh, Mr. Washington. So, Juror Santiago had at his disposal the testimonial and demonstrative evidence that was, that was elicited at trial. And he, can, and he did his demonstration in the jury room before all the jurors. So it's your position that his reenactment, or whatever word you want to use, was based on testimony, even if it wasn't one particular piece of testimony by one witness. It was inferences he drew from all of the testimony together. 
correct. And, and if you look at the pages that I, that I just cited to, which I cite to in, in my brief, you'll see an exchange between the, the witness, counsel, and the court. You know, so either the counsel or court would say, may the record reflect uh, a downward circular motion, may the regular, record reflect such and such a motion, and, and then the witness would say, well, he did it like this. Which, of course, is done in open court in front of the judge and in a controlled environment. Correct. And not only that, but observed by the jurors. So they were able to see for themselves the manner in which the, the defendant wielded the knives. And so when they go into the jury room to, to conduct this demonstration, they're not guessing. They're not pulling information from outside the, uh, the trial. They saw with their own eyes how the witnesses uh, demonstrated the, the stabbings. And as far as the extrajudicial uh, goings-on at, at Mr. Santiago's home, the only time the deer carcass was mentioned, it was in counsel's affidavit in support of the 33030 motion. In an email to Mr. Santiago, the uh, defense attorney says, is it accurate that you conduct an experiment at home to, in order to determine you know, the, the orientation of the wound or the identity of the stabber? No mention of a deer carcass in any of the email exchanges between counsel and Mr. Santiago. No mention of a deer carcass at Santiago's hearing testimony. Juror Wesley Errol and Edwin Perez testified at the hearing. No mention of a deer carcass by either of them. No mention of a deer carcass in any of the three affidavits submitted by other jurors. Sir, what was your understanding based on the hearing testimony of, of the purpose of this reenactment, demonstration, whatever the, noun we'd like well, to use. Well, the purpose, as, as Mr. Santiago put it, was he hy hypothesized that the stabbing had to have been made by someone from behind Mr. Washington, someone of a smaller stature. And so he wanted to demonstrate his theory. Smaller than who? That's a, that's a good question, Your Honor. He says, he says of a smaller stature, I would assume that's smaller than the defendant. And, and so he wanted to demonstrate that, that hypothesis uh, in, order, in order to show, convince his fellow jurors that someone other than the defendant committed, delivered the fatal blow. And so he's advocating on behalf of the defendant. And so there's no way that the defendant could claim that, that his confrontation right was, was uh, prejudiced because he, he doesn't have the right to cross-examine the witnesses for him. He has the right to cross-examine witnesses ag against him, but not the ones for him. And, and, and even Santiago went on to say in his emails that he was able to, to talk down other jurors from murder in the second degree down to manslaughter. And, and so that's, that's another benefit. And, and unless this court has any further questions, I ask that you affirm the judgment. Thank you. Thank you very much. The notion that Mr. Santiago talked down the jurors from murder to manslaughter, first of all, it's, it's offensive because we have no idea what happened in that jury room, who said what. We know we have a juror who went home and conducted experiments, whether on a meat or a deer carcass. We know he came back and told the jurors about it. We also know that he was interested in the height of the assailant, which was not an issue at trial, so what is he reenacting? We also know that he thought that Mr. Washington was stabbed from behind. Again, not an issue at trial. Well, if we could just back up for a second, though. If, if the, one of the main defenses was Defendant didn't do it, and that could be then therefore it could be the stab wound, the area of the stab wound, and and it, 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 the entry wound, the degree that may have some relevance as to who was tall enough or in the uh, right uh, position vis-a-vis -vis the victim to stab the person. But that's not what the defense was arguing. That's only what Mr. Santiago was arguing. We don't know what the jurors were thinking. We also can say that the manslaughter conviction is thoroughly consistent with the evidence. This was a, a melee. Thank you. We'd Thank you. Thank you.
Thompson versus Rodney. Good afternoon. May it please the court. My name is Renee Myatt, and I represent the appellant in this appeal. Uh, there are six issues that I wanted to bring to the court's attention. Uh, the first being with respect to the issue that arose at trial regarding the plaintiff's drinking. The plaintiff was, I'm sure you read the brief so you know the facts and I won't go over the facts. There was a document, actually two documents, one being the EMS uh, report as well as hospital records that reflected that the plaintiff had had three to four drinks and also had alcohol in her breath. It was my position at trial that that information should come before the jury for the main and critical purpose of assessing not only the plaintiff's uh, mental and physical stability at the time of the incident or the alleged incident, but also speaking to any contributory negligence but on the part of the plaintiff. Is that evidence only admissible if it's relevant to uh, treatment and diagnosis? I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. Isn't such evidence from the hospital records, the EMT records, only admissible if it is relevant to diagnosis and treatment? Well, yes and, yes and no, meaning that the information or the statements made by the plaintiff at the time of, of the arriving at the hospital and certainly with EMS, the fact that she gave that information to both EMS and the hospital and particularly on the, on the EMS report, is under the presumptive diagnosis. So it has to deal with diagnosis in terms of how they intend to treat her. So it's not, it's not just the fact that, it's not just the diagnosis, but yes, the diagnosis and treatment is important, and the fact that she has had several drinks, or three to four drinks, is important. But again, with respect to the drinking, it was my position at trial that I would, wanted the jurors to understand that uh, Ms. Uh, Thompson had not come to the court, with all due respect to her, with clean hands. So I thought it was important that the, that the jurors hear what her condition was at the time of this incident. You have to recall, well, you may not recall, because in this particular case, this was a case not about uh, handrails, it wasn't about defect. This was a case of credibility. And I was alleging at trial that the plaintiff and her boyfriend, who was an employee of the defendant, concocted this story in order to sue the defendant. I, during the course of the trial, I did not deny that the plaintiff suffered a twisted ankle, went to the hospital, had some surgery. My whole position was with respect to the fact that they made up this story for the sole purpose of suing my client, who was a private homeowner. When I discuss in my brief the fact that the plaintiff was not able or did not talk about what the specific defect was that called, caused her to fall, that was, that was huge. She was not able to say what caused her to fall. There's some testimony, or rather the record reflects, that at one point she says, it was the second step that caused her to fall. Then the, it, early on, it was a big uh, bag of garbage that caused her to fall. But in the absence of us knowing, the defendants knowing exactly what caused her to fall, we are at a disadvantage in terms of being able to defend. Ma'am, did she mention, was there evidence as well regarding the, the illumination of the stairway, the, the staircase? Yeah, so there was testimony with respect to the, the light. And you if certainly read the brief, the discussion with respect to the light, my clients testified was on a timer. No big surprise, obviously, the plaintiff and her witness, uh, the uh, defendant's employee, testified that the light was out. So yes, I understand that counsel has, has argued that there was this culmination of 
uh, if you will, defects that caused this particular incident. But it is our position that when the plaintiff brought this case, this case was specifically about a, a plastic bag of some sort that caused her to fall. It's only during the course and at the time of trial, now there's, and even at the appeal stage, where now you have this combination or culmination of, of different issues. And the issues being the, not only the bag, but they want to address the, the illumination that you speak to, as well as the handrail. And the handrail is, is so critical to, to my case, it, it really speaks to my efforts to have going, the photographs. I'm going to let you address the handrail during the rebuttal time, OK? OK, thank you. Thank you. So, so no, the oh, time's up. Rebuttal. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Good afternoon, Your Honors. Uh, may it please the court. My name is Stephen Nappi, and I represent the plaintiff respondent, Renee Thompson. So, counsel, a, a question as to the uh, uh, ambulance report and the um, hospital record. With respect to alcohol, presence of alcohol, or the, uh, let's call it an admission, of the, the alleged admission of the plaintiff, that she had alcohol in her system. Um, why is that not germane to diagnosis and treatment, thereby allowing such evidence to come into, um, such information to come into the record as evidence? It's, it's not germane to uh, diagnosis and treatment because the notations here, alcohol on breath and three to four drinks, which is what the, the ambulance call report says, uh, is not evidence of intoxication, which but is, is that the issue it, intoxication or is or is the issue diagnosis and is the standard whether the person is intoxicated or the standard whether it's germane to diagnosis and treatment? Uh, this the standard is whether it's germane to diagnosis and treatment, but it, it, whether she had three to four drinks or alcohol on breath is not germane to diagnosis and treatment. The ambulance call report, uh, had a field on it for presenting problems. One of those fields that the EMS worker could have filled in was a bubble for uh, ETOH, ethanol use. That was not filled in. But the bubble, as you call it, for alcohol on breath, AOB, was, was checked, right? There was a notation in the narrative that said positive AOB, not in a different part of the report uh, that also had a section for presenting problems. So if it a query on my part. If there's a, a an, if there's information as to uh, three drinks, I believe, in the ambulance report, and then one drink in the um, hospital record, um, AOB in the ambulance report, no AOB in the hospital record. Um, is that information that could probably properly come before the jury? Um, on credibility grounds, relevance as? It, it does not because it, it's unduly prejudicial. In this particular case, three to four drinks, we don't know what three to four drinks means. It says three to four drinks hours ago. We don't know how many hours ago. These notations don't indicate what alcohol content, if any, might have been in the plaintiff's system at the time of the accident and uh, no blood alcohol testing was done at the time of the, uh, at the time uh, when plaintiff got to the hospital because the hospital personnel noted that she did not have alcohol on her breath and there were no indicators that would warrant the test of her blood alcohol content. Absent some evidence that would suggest that she had a blood alcohol content that could show that she was intoxicated, impaired, uh, that it could have somehow caused or contributed to the happening of the accident, it's overly, it's unduly prejudicial for a jury to see three to four drinks, alcohol on breath, when that could have, when her, her state of mind or her functional capacity could have been um, not impaired at all. Counsel, are you, are you done? Yeah. I have a question. You, the court instructed the jury, I assume at your request, um, on your client's theory of liability premised on the lack of a handrail. But there's no statute requiring this staircase to have a handrail. Why wasn't it 
error, reversible error, for the court to give that instruction in the absence of a statute requiring a handrail? Uh, my understanding is that the court instructed the jury as to multiple dwelling law. Um, the, the section of the multiple dwelling law regarding the general negligence standard as to uh, multiple dwelling owners' duty to maintain the property in a reasonably safe condition. And do we know when the building, does the record show when the building was built and whether it was subject to the multiple dwelling law? The, um, I, don't, I don't know, Your Honor. I don't believe so. Yeah, but going back to Judge Gesma's question, what statute required the handrail? I'm sorry, Your Honor, I missed going that. Going back to Judge Gesmer's question, I don't think you finished answering it. What section, what statute required the handrail? So I'm not aware of the court charging the jury with uh, it requiring the handrail. Well, did you, did you plead it? Did you argue it, that there was some we there was argued, a particular statutory provision requiring a handrail? I, I don't believe that was, no, I don't believe that, that was argued or charged. That wasn't part of the case that there was a failure to install a handrail? That was the allegation the accident? that it was unreasonable for the landlord to not have a handrail in the stairs. Okay, let's hear. I'm sorry, do you want to ask another question? Uh, there, is a, there is a statute that requires an outside stairway to have a handrail, but that was not pled. Is, is that correct? You pled general negligence, uh, unreasonable, not a reasonably safe condition. Am I correct? Th that's correct, Your Honor. Thank you. So, Your Honor, with respect to the, the handrail, my position had been during the course of the trial that a couple of things. One is that the plaintiff needed to pr produce an expert to explain to the jury whether or not there was a violation of the multiple dwelling law and not just read that statute to the jury, primarily because, based on Your Honor's questions, the jury would have to understand whether or not a handrail is, in some fashion, a violation of the multiple dwelling law. In the absence of an expert telling them that, the jurors are otherwise just speculating on whether or not that is a requirement. And, and the presence of a handrail also goes to my argument with respect to the authentication of the photographs, because it's my position that the photographs introduced at the time of trial, no big surprise, of course it showed a handrail. But my whole point was that there was no testimony that indicated when the photographs were taken and who took them. And that is primarily because the building, as you note, was, was, built, was bought by my client in 1976, but it was sold sometime in 2016. New owner had the building, and my client's testimony was that there was, no, there was a handrail when he had the building. And so my concern that I wanted the jurors to understand was that it was very possible, given today's technology, that Photographs can be altered, they can be doctored, and, and suddenly when they produce photographs with no handrail, that it was suspect. And not being allowed to, to challenge it, which I did based on objections, challenge the fact that these photographs were going in was prejudicial to my client, and any testimony with respect to the handrail and the multiple dwelling law needed to have an expert produced by the plaintiff in order for a jury to understand exactly what their role was in this case. Ma'am, assuming that you, that uh, you were improperly precluded from introducing evidence of the plaintiff's alcohol intake. For what purpose did you want to offer that evidence? Did you want to offer it to demonstrate that her ability to perceive the events on the night in question were impaired? Did you want to offer it uh, in support of a comparative fault charge under 2 colon 36? Or did you want to go uh, with the nuclear option and, and, and offer it for a, a charge under 2 colon 45, the um, intoxicated plaintiff? I, I was mainly interested in actually two of those. I was interested in her ability to perceive and also the, the fact that, that she was intoxic excuse me, intoxicated at the time of the incident and, and therefore was contributory to, the, to, her in, to her own injuries. So I wasn't going for the nuclear effect, but I was going certainly for the first two, yes. Oh. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> First, Mercury versus Nova Restoration.
Your Honor, sorry to speak out of turn. Uh, I represent the uh, plaintiff respondent, First Mercury. We have a Pro Hoc Vice application for uh, Mr. Gary Cole, who's with me today, and we're requesting permission for him to argue on behalf of First Mercury. Motion's granted. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Uh, Joe McGovern from the firm of Wilson Elser. It's a pleasure to be here today uh, representing the appellant uh, defendants, uh, Cobblestone Lofts Condominium and the Andrews Organization. The court below made a number of errors in a, a series of orders deciding uh, summary judgment motions and then motions to renew. Um, Can I ask you a specific question, and it's about Insurance Law 3420D. Um, there was some discussion in the briefs, but not as much as I might have liked, about whether or not it does or does not apply in this action. It's undisputed, correct, that there are bodily injury claims present in this action. That is correct, Your Honor. What is the body of case law that now exists as to whether those mixed claims that involve both bodily injury and uh, property damage, whether or not uh, 14, I'm sorry, 3420D apply to those type of claims? Uh, quite honestly, I found no case law on this uh, mixed claim you issue. You didn't find any cases at all? Honestly, I could not. And so you're saying that this is an issue of first impression for us? It may be. And uh, As far as you know? As far as I know, and my limited abilities, and, um, you know, we're, we're retained by insurance companies, so we only get so much time to do research. Uh, but I could not find any, honestly. But the Court of Appeals has said that 3420D2 applies to cases involving uh, bodily injuries. Uh, Let me ask you, this case is primarily a property damage case, or is it not? I wouldn't say that. Um, the, the plaintiffs in this case are, oh, the plaintiffs in the underlying case, uh, uh, Shane McMahon, his wife, and their kids, are... Uh, they're celebrities. He's uh, the owner or the part owner of Worldwide Wrestling Entertainment. Um, uh, his mother ran for governor in Connecticut. His, but his he, claimed, he claimed bodily injuries. Uh, so they, let me ask you a question. They, well, more than that, they claim that their kids were actually poisoned by exposure to toxic mold, and they've become sick, and they've been sick ever since, he okay, said. Okay, so if 3420D does apply, and if we find that it applies, how should we determine in this action, whether it was or was not satisfied? Uh, there's no way that it could be satisfied. The, um, the, the plaintiff, uh, First Mercury, and the defendant, American uh, Empire, they were notified of these uh, claims uh, in 2014, and to this day, they still haven't issued a formal written disclaimer of coverage, and it was years does before 34, they... Does 3420 require a formal official Disclaimer of coverage to satisfy 3420? It, it absolutely does. It must be a written disclaimer of coverage, and it must be issued within a reasonable time. And a little while ago, you were... You're saying as a matter of law, 3420 was not satisfied, and we should never even get to the issue of, um, of whether or not the exclusions apply based on the, the late disclaimer. Yes, Your Honor. Does uh, 3420 apply solely to the uh, personal injury, bodily injury aspects of the case, but not to the property damage aspects of the case? I is, it an all or no, is it an all or nothing kind of statute? I think it's an all or nothing kind of statute, Your Honor. I mean, you can't, uh... well, let's, let's uh, assume arguendo that you can split the, the statute up. It's now prejudicial to the defendants in the underlying case uh, because they've now spent several years uh, setting up their uh, case, how they're going to defend it, and they probably would then want to say, oh, this is a real personal injury case, and this is why we should settle with money from First Mercury and American Ent uh, Empire. Uh, so I, it's got to be all or nothing, otherwise... Is that the only reason why you're arguing it should be all or nothing? Because you're saying there's no authority that really addresses this issue. Is it just your policy reason that you think they would have litigated it differently? Well, I, I think on the on the clear wording of the statute, uh, you have to say that it's, you know, for cases involving. So if there's a component of a case that is uh, property damage, uh, that can't serve to negate uh, the application of, of the statute. Wouldn't this actually be 
a very easy, I mean, there aren't really that many cases that are hybrid since we don't even have any case law about it, but wouldn't it be fairly simple to break out the property damage and the, and the personal injury claim to say, okay, under the statute, 3420 applies to the, to the personal injury claims and it doesn't apply to the property damage? Why, why couldn't we separate them out in this case? Um, well, that's a, that's a novel concept. It, it would cause great confusion. Um, uh, it's one that was not, when I say novel, I mean it wasn't brought up by opposing counsel who were very good. Um, but it would, it would cause an, an inordinate amount of confusion in the defense of the underlying case uh, that should be avoided. It would also, um, as I'm thinking on the fly here, you, you'd also probably get, uh, open up a new can of worms because any case that does have mixed issues of personal injury and property damage, such as an auto case, um, you would find people disclaiming because, well, I'm not going to cover the property damage because you didn't do X, Y. Thank you, and you have some time for rebuttal. Thank you. Afternoon. May it please the court. Uh, Gary Cull with Kennedy CMK for First Mercury. Um, uh, the court just asked a, a bunch of questions, and I, I think they kind of assume that we could have disclaimed earlier than we did. And I think um, Judge Ostrager's, or Justice Ostrager's, interim order, where he denied us summary judgment, is kind of prima facie evidence that we couldn't have disclaimed earlier. This is an odd case where an Can insurance company... you explain what you mean by that? Go ahead. Can um, you explain what you mean by that? <laughs> and I, I didn't understand your statement, so I'm asking. Uh, you, no, I'm, I'm trying to remember what I said. Um, that you couldn't have disclaimed earlier because of the way the summary judgment motion was handled. And that's what I'm just getting to. The, the, the odd thing about this case is that an insurance company is being challenged, not by its policyholder, by the way, by a, a, an, a, another party, because our policyholder didn't perfect its appeal, but we're being challenged for, at the time the claim came in, not being able to decide that the EAPS exclusion barred coverage. And so we didn't know that it barred coverage. We, we certainly weren't certain that it barred coverage. If we had disclaimed, and a few years later, Justice Ostrager said, well, no, you, you, you were wrong. I can't decide that you were right about your disclaimer. That's a breach. God knows what happened in that. My, my insured goes bankrupt. There's a default judgment. There's a confessed judgment. And so what the insurance company does in this case is it says, I'm going to protect my policyholder. I'm going to provide them with a defense pursue a declaratory judgment action like we did here. You're saying and that, you're saying that, that's my, are you saying 3420D is satisfied by giving a defense and submitting a reservation of rights? If you can't disclaim, if, if you know, if the plaintiff was an employee and I had an employee exclusion and they alleged This an isn't employee, brief though in, in, in the papers, is it? This is brief. This is the brief fact, decision? the fact that 3420 doesn't apply was found by Justice Ostrager, the fact that we could not have disclaimed earlier. And right, that but did you brief, I'm sorry, to interrupt. Okay. did you brief what would happen if it did apply? Even if it did apply, I think we're timely. That's the point about not being able to disclaim sooner because we didn't, it, it's not a clear cut disclaimer, which is why we filed the DJ and why we picked up the defense. Rather than hang our insured out, disclaim improperly and find out three years later that we are in breach and that we've caused our insured you're to You're saying default. you needed a discovery to determine whether or not you could disclaim? There was discovery done, and even at that point, when we moved for summary judgment, Justice Ostrager decided there's a couple of little points here that I'm not sure about, and that's when he allowed us to, get, to go and inspect the property. Nobody objected. Everybody joined in the request to get experts. We got one. Nobody rebutted it. He came back and, and filled in the blanks in Justice Ostrager's interim decision. And at so that you're saying point, that 30, even if 3420D did apply, it wasn't violated because exactly, you exactly. claimed as soon as was reasonably practical under the circumstances. Exactly. I think it was, I think it was timely, and, I, and we're not getting to the, the body of the exclusion, but I think if you look at the facts and you look at the exclusion, you can see that it's, this is Justice Ostrager. He's kind of an insurance coverage, a bit of a legend in, in our world, and if there's anything he knows how to do, it's uh, <laughs> interpret okay. an exclusion. Thank you very much. Thank you. May it please the court, John McKenna for American Empire uh, Surplus Lines Insurance Company. 
And just to add on to the 3420D issue, not every case that uh, it involves bodily injury deserves a dis disclaimer. Um, so not every case that what? Any bodily injury claim or, or part, you know, this, this, this claim is, is primarily a, a property damage claim. It, it has a bodily injury component. But under 3420 and the case law that's in our briefs, you, an insurer can reserve rights if there is not, if there's a reasonable belief or a reasonable basis to say, we don't know. We don't know if there is grounds to disclaim. And it would have been a disservice to the insured if, if the disclaimer was issued when the carrier, you know, I, I think. What's your position as to the initial issue, which is whether 3420D should or should not apply? And do you agree there's no precedent that addresses this? On a, on a combined situation? Yeah. Yes. There, we hadn't found any prejudice either. That's why, it, any precedent either. That's why it's not in our brief. But in our brief, it's clear. We reserve rights properly under 3420, and the case law supports the reservation of rights in a situation like this, where even Justice Ostrager was uh, unable to determine the applicability of the exclusion until there was two motions and uh, four experts to decide, you know, whether or not this exclusion applies. And, and, and it's still disputed. Uh, the appellant's counsel still disputes whether or not the exclusion applies. So as my colleague said, this is not clear cut. This was not clear cut from the beginning. And I think it's still disputed now because we haven't got into the exclusion, but. Although he did make a finding, he did make a finding on that. As ultimately. A Ultimately. He ultimately made a finding the court below as a matter of law that the exclusion did apply. He did, but it took, you know. You're saying he couldn't have made that until experts were hired and retained. And, and, it, and it was disputed. It wasn't clear cut. It wasn't a situation where there was no. Is, is, if, if there's a case where it's not clear cut, you're saying the case law supports you doing a reservation of rights and waiting to disclaim till there's some certainty about whether or not there is a valid disclaimer? Yes. As opposed to disclaim now, fight later? Yes. And then the issue would be whether, which would be generally an issue of fact, whether your uh, delay, if you will, in, in disclaiming was reasonable under the Correct. Okay. Correct. And, and Judge Ostrager found it to be, you know, reasonable to reserve rights as we did timely. But he never made that finding, did he? Didn't he just ultimately, in the, the renewal, find that 3420 didn't apply? Well, I, I think he ultimately make that finding. No, I think he did did find that there were timely dis, timely reservation of rights. That's that's the issue. I think Justice Ostrager found that the reservation of rights were timely, and that approach is allowed in situations where the disclaimer would not have been clear cut. In a situation like this, where you know it was it was a, a complex issue on whether or not this exclusion, this EFS exclusion, would apply. Anything um, else? Unless you want to hear about the EFS exclusion. No, I mean, no, yeah. we'll, we'll okay. figure that out on our own. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Um, on rebuttal, um, the reservations of rights letters that were issued by American Empire and by First Mercury. Can I ask you a question? Do you agree with them that Justice Ostriger made a decision about the reservation of rights that it was timely under, under 3420D? I do not agree. Um, but he did seem to indicate that the reservation of rights is what uh, is a proper way to extend your time. Um, Which would mean that he was finding it was timely. It was appropriate. It wasn't it didn't violate 3420D. He didn't state it specifically, but um, if he did, that would also be error. These reservation of rights letters came two months and eight months after the insurers had all of the information they needed when they Let received the complaint. Let me ask you, the there complaint. was, a, as they're saying, a tremendous uncertainty about this exclusion initially, and discovery did need to take place to some degree to find out whether or not this... Um, Getting the name, but the EIFS was actually in the structure and where in the structure it was. So, didn't they need to actually do some 
discovery, hire an expert to make a determination about that? So wasn't it reasonable to do a reservation under those circumstances? No, it's not completely unreasonable. And I'll tell you why. A little while ago, you heard arguments on the Westco insurance case. And two days after they were informed of that crane collapse, they had an expert out there investigating. Here, uh, the insurers never bothered to conduct any discovery during the declaratory judgment action. And it was only after they had filed the note of issue, said all discovery is complete, I moved to vacate it, and they opposed me. They said, no, no, all discovery is complete. Move on to summary okay. judgment. And then Thank you they... very much. Thank you. Thank you. Birnbaum versus Goldenberg Consulting. <clears throat> Good afternoon, may it please the court. William A. Thomas for appellant. Uh, there are two appeals here. As you know, uh, one from denial of a motion for summary judgment, uh, the second from denial of leave to amend the complaint. Um, I'll just proceed directly to the summary judgment motion. Uh, first, uh, we respectfully submit that uh, the court below erred uh, in finding that respondents had sustained their burden of coming forward uh, and making a prima facie showing in opposition to summary judgment, um, and that are derived principally from the court's apparent consideration of a prior affidavit uh, in which uh, we submit that the respondent effectively admitted the agreement uh, on which we base Counsel, our case. doesn't your case really turn on the fact that your claim is that the agreement would go on for longer than one year, and so then we have to determine whether there's a statute of frauds issue. Isn't that really the critical well, issue? Well, I, I mean, that's their position. Well, I'm, I'm asking you why that isn't the critical issue. Well, it's not the critical issue for a couple of reasons. First of all, and it ties directly back to uh, you know, our principal argument substantively, there was a judicial agreement, I'm sorry, a judicial admission of the agreement. Now, in... I'm sorry, what, what, in what form did that... And where are you claiming that that judicial admission occurred, and what are you claiming was the, were the terms of that agreement as judicially admitted? In her affidavit, in Ms. Goldenberg's affidavit, in a prior case, uh, she said, in a prior related case, was another placement fee arising from the same relationship. She said, quote, and you have it in the record, I merely told him, <clears throat> she started by saying there was no agreement. Then in the very next sentence, she says, I merely told him to send me resumes. I'm sorry, I simply told him to send me resumes. <laughs> and if any of the people get placed, I would pay him 50% of what was received for the placement. I submit that that is as unambiguous an admission of an agreement and its terms as it's possible to get. And but why isn't that, as stated by you, why isn't that a, a, an agreement that could last longer than a year and therefore barred by the statute of frauds? Well, that's a complicated question, Judge. But well, That's I, what, why I'm asking you. Well, I, <laughs> <laughs> if, um, <laughs> what would, what could last for more than a year, what could, la well, first of all, what could last for more than a year uh, without my client having to perform additionally is her obligation to pay him for whatever she did with these candidates. But counsel, if it's barred by the statute of frauds, is what my colleague is saying, then there is no obligation because it's barred by the statute of frauds. And the, it is undisputed in this case that all the placements for which your client is seeking recovery were, in fact, placements that occurred more than a year after the agreement that you both agree you entered into, you're disagreeing as to the terms, but you both agreed there was an agreement. But there's no question in the case before us that these were placements more than a year out. So then the question has to become, how did you satisfy the statute of frauds? Assuming it is within the statute of frauds, 
least, or at we least just, we just ascertained it is because they were not performed within a year. Assuming that it was within the statute of frauds, Your Honors, there are at least three applicable exceptions, two of which were acknowledged by the motion court. Um, I submit that the motion court should have also acknowledged. How did you satisfy them? Pardon? How did you satisfy them? Well, the first one, uh, which would be 5-701 B3C of the, of the GOL, says that where you admit to a contract in a legal proceeding, which she did repeatedly, not least in the but affidavit. Did she admit to a contract in perpetuity? The fact that she admitted that there was some kind of contract does not equal that she agreed the contract would last forever. Well, I, I respectfully disagree. I would suggest that if someone says, all you have to do is send me resumes, and if any of the people get placed, I will pay you half of what I make, that is, in fact, in perpetuity, in the absence of some sort of limiting language. Um, so, I mean, either that is an exception to the statute of frauds that takes the analysis out of 5-701A. Thank you. Or Thank it's you. not. And there okay. are other exceptions. We'll hear you in rebuttal. Thank, Thank you. you. <clears throat> Good afternoon. Uh, may it please the court, my name is David Marcus, attorney for the respondent, uh, uh, Golden, Goldenberg Consulting Group, Inc. Um, I'm going to start with the motion, the motion for summary judgment. The, the lower court properly denied the motion for summary judgment, finding that there were issues of fact as to what, as to what the terms of the agreement are, because they're not, they're, the evidence shows that the, doc, there's, the terms are not included in, in, the, in the whatever written documents uh, a petition, um, Appellant claims there are, and there were issues of performance. Um, the low, but where the low court erred is that the lower court should not have found that the um, appellant satisfied its initial, his initial burden. Also, um, in, in Why? fact, this. Why? Because the because because the material terms of the agreement were not provided. The only the only art, the only um, term regarding. Um, splitting was not all the terms, and my client submitted. Well, we submitted multiple emails where my client required performance of certain obligations that wasn't included. Also, the, the length of the of the uh, of the referral split um, wasn't included. So, for that reason alone, the, court, um, the play, appellant didn't satisfy his initial burden. But also, there was no meeting of the minds. There was also the, 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 the CPAs themselves who testified that appellant had nothing to do with their placement and that they, they sought out my client afterwards, long after, in order to get the placement, in order to get, to get placements. So for what that about reason, your friend's argument that the, the, the emails between the parties were sufficient to constitute um, a memorandum containing all the material terms of an agreement sufficient to satisfy the statute of frauds? Uh, but it, but they don't. All, all the e the emails actually show, especially for my client, was requirements on the plan on the appellant to perform, which he clearly didn't do. Um, Ms. Goldenberg stated okay, well, whether there was performance or not. But as far as the spreading out of the terms, what in your view was missing from these emails uh, that would 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 make this uh, uh, make it fatal to his claim that he satisfied the statute of frauds? Well, well one key issue. Which is the main issue, and I think it was brought up earlier, was that the length of the term, the length of the time that the referrals would 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 go forward. Um, it's unheard of for agreements to be in perpetuity in any form, especially in this industry, where um, where and also t to send email. What, what was the also what was a referral? What constituted a referral? In one instance with Mr. Efren, the the appellant didn't even work with Mr. Efren, didn't know him. He copied his his, his, his didn't even provide a resume. And that's another issue, is that no res there's no evidence of any resumes being sent to, uh, to my client. None. With respect to Mr. Efren, who, who appellant didn't even know, he copied Mr. Efren's LinkedIn profile, sent it to my client. Appellant could go and copy and paste thousands of uh, LinkedIn profiles from CPA, send them to my client, and then claim, I referred them to you, so if you place any of these people, I get a, 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 a fee in perpetuity. And, and that's, there's no, there's, that's not included in any of the emails that, that we see. Um, 
Additionally, the court has discretion here to search the record and grant summary judgment in favor of my client. And especially with respect to general obligations law, with respect to the statute of frauds, this agreement does fall within the statute of frauds. My client would have to either not make these placements in order to avoid having to pay a referral fee or pay a referral fee in perpetuity. And in the Levine case that was cited, the court specifically found that that would violate the statute of frauds. But there's also 7501A10, which, the court, which courts have found applies to referral fees. That has nothing to do with the time period. That just says that if there's a referral fee, uh, a contract for a referral fee, that has to be in writing. Those were not in writing. The, the lower court also erred because 7501B3A um, um, applies to qualified financial contracts. 5701B um, refers to those types of agreements only. It does not cover this agreement. So it was improper to apply 5701B3. And the well, set, well settled precedent in the first department is that we, even if you have a writing, all the material terms have to be included. You just can't, you can't just be an admission Thank as an agreement. Counsel. The material terms must be there. All you need to know about the supposed requirement that my client was supposed to perform more, was supposed to do anything more than send resumes, even assuming that she's not bound by her judicial statement to precisely that effect, or repeated judicial statements to precisely that effect, assuming that there were, in fact, any other performance obligations beyond sending resumes, all you have to look at are the emails regarding Efron, the, the third of the three accountants here, who my client freely admits he never knew or spoke to, and who everybody agrees my client merely sent the resume of uh, to the respondent. In response to which, the respondent, uh, in a chain of emails starting at page, uh, I believe it is, uh, 35 of the record, I'm sorry, 135 of the record, says, are you going to, is he going to call me? That's all I, just when's he going to call me because I have an accounting okay. firm I want to send counsel. him to. Thank so, you. He ordered waiver. Thank you, Your Honors. <laughs> the next case is Harlington Realty versus Lawrence Plumbing. May it please the court, Michael Paneth for the appellants, Lawrence Plumbing and Edward Honig. Before we begin to address the questions of whether we, the lease was properly terminated, I think there's a threshold issue that has to be addressed, which is the fact that the lease never was valid to begin with. It was void ab initio and unenforceable. The law is clear that where the party who signs as the purported owner in a lease Did you assert not, that defense in your answer? So we did not, and that's an argument that they made. Um, and and what why we, should we consider it now? So we cited a number of cases, authoritative cases, in our reply, which say that um, where there was no surprise or prejudice, which in this case there wasn't, uh, for for a host of reasons, and in fact there there isn't even an allegation that there was any sort of surprise or prejudice, um, and and that's in large part because of the fact that we were trying to address this throughout during discovery. At the, time that we, at the time that the action was commenced and we filed the answer, we didn't know that they didn't own the, the premises. They represented throughout the lease that they did. We served discovery demands asking for this information. The court, in fact, ordered them to produce this information. We asked questions at the depositions, and their did principal- Did you move to amend your answer? Uh, we did not because, again, we still didn't have the answer to the question. The court had ordered them to produce it. We, we asked at a deposition who the owner of the property was, and the answer that we got from their principal was that she didn't know. So our time to, to amend, um, frankly, you know, and, and that is, by the way, something that we discussed with the court at multiple conferences that we intended to seek leave to amend once we had the answer to those questions. The court ordered them to produce the information to us. They never produced it to us. And so t as of today, they still haven't given us an answer 
to who it is that owns the property, let alone what it is the relationship is between the property owner and this entity. It's, the, the other point, Your Honor, is that it's, it's not a waivable defense. If the, if the agreement is Is that is all you want to argue about? Do you want to address some of the other issues? Um, sure, Your Honor. Um, assuming for argument's sake that the agreement was valid to begin with, then we come to the question of constructive eviction. We cited a number of serious structural that issues. precluded by the language of the lease, which has pretty strict language about no offsets, and your only uh, remedy is to bring an action for damages? So, so that's talking about a rent offset. That's correct. Um, but the constructive eviction case law says that constructive eviction is different. I'm sorry. As a constructive evi eviction, didn't you agree that you would take possession as is and take responsibility for maintenance and repairs? For many things, but, but that specifically excluded structural issues as well as common areas. That's very clear in the, in the rider. Uh, at number 46, it's, it says structural issues are the landlord's responsibility, and it defines what that includes, including the okay, foundation. Let's say it's covered. Let's assume that for argument. Did you raise that in your answer or assert it as a counterclaim? That we did, yes. We, constructive eviction? We didn't use the words constructive eviction, but each of the elements of a constructive eviction claim were asserted as affirmative defenses. You didn't defenses. know the term constructive eviction? Your Honor, it's not that we didn't know it. We, we alleged each of the elements separately. Again, we come back to the argument that there's certainly no prejudice or surprise here. This was addressed very heavily by both parties. In fact, plaintiff's counsel grilled the defendant on this issue at his, at his deposition. So there's certainly no issue of surprise. But again... Let's go back to the first thing I brought up. Why wouldn't it be barred by the no offsets uh, for any kind of rent? Which is, that's what you're claiming. The rent's not due because you were constructively evicted. So why wouldn't it be barred by that? Person? Because that's a casualty clause. That's talking about if you have an argument relating to, right, they, they cited to that, but that's a clause that talks about fire, wind storms, and things of that nature. And if that's, if that's the case, you can't get a rent offset. Doesn't it say no offsets whatsoever of any nature, except when it's a fire? Relating to casualties. But the case law is clear that constructive eviction is an exception to that. Constructive eviction terminates the lease without any further obligation whatsoever on the part of defendants. So it does not fall within that category. Um, the next point is that even assuming the lease was valid and that they weren't constructively evicted, then we come to the termination clause that was contained in the agreement. Now, Lawrence Plumbing sent the termination notice, gave the 120-day notice, terminated on time. Um, their argument is that we still have to pay the rent through the, through the end of the lease term. The agreement discusses this. Terminating the lease and, and leaving the premises I'm is not... I'm going to let you respond to that in rebuttal. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. Good afternoon, Your Honors. May it please the court, Stephen Uden, for the- Let me ask you, what's your response to their argument about standing? Well, a couple of things. One is, in their answer, they admit the lease. It was one of the clauses, one of the paragraphs in the, in the amended complaint, and in their amended answer, they admit to the lease. Number one. Number two, they did not raise standing, capacity, an invalid lease, any of those as an affirmative defense. So the combination of them admitting the lease and not raising a defense as to any of those issues, invalidity or standing, they've waived it. Besides which, the parties operated under this lease for eight years. There's no issue as to whether it was a valid lease or an invalid lease. They operated under it for, for eight full years. And it was never an issue or an incident with regard to that. Uh, but most importantly, it was never raised as an affirmative defense, and they admitted to the lease in their answer. As to the issue of constructive eviction, there are two, pro two problems with their argument, as Your Honor has alluded to. One, they took this property as is, and they don't have the right to now complain about the condition of lack of repairs because they agreed to take possession as is. That's number one, and number two, they did not raise constructive eviction as an affirmative defense, nor did they pose it as a counterclaim. 
And the answer was amended. There were two answers. There was an answer and then an amended answer. Constructive eviction, standing, invalid lease. None of these were raised as, as affirmative defenses in either version of the answer. And as this court, in a somewhat similar case less than a year ago, Blue Water versus uh, the Salon of Great Neck Management, dealt with this issue and very clearly said that the trial court properly declined to consider the defense of construction of constructive eviction when it's not raised as an answer or posed as a counterclaim. And that's exactly what happened here. Um, the, the third issue, the, the argument that, that Tennant has with regard to early termination fails as the trial court easily saw because they rely on a, on a clause, a good guy clause, in a guarantee, in a personal guarantee. And the guarantee, by its own language, says this guarantee shall terminate, and then it gives you the conditions for termination of the guarantee. It has to be current on the rent, and it has to be noticed, and there are a bunch of considerations. But those all apply only to the guarantor. There's no document to which appellants cite for any authority that they have the right to early terminate the lease other than the personal guarantees good guy clause, which clearly does not pertain to them. And the trial court rightly concluded that that was meant to protect the guarantor, not the tenant. And the court rejected that argument as respectfully this court should as well. And the only other defense that they raise or an excuse for not paying, which they clearly did not pay rent for the last 21 months of the lease, is that the, our motion for summary judgment was premature because they needed more discovery. They conducted three depositions of the, of the plaintiff in this case. The judge entertained issues with regard to discovery in countless conferences and ultimately said, this is enough already. Discovery is complete, put the case on the trial calendar, and their motion to compel was denied, and their argument that our motion was premature was denied because discovery was exhausted. Besides, their defenses are all dictated by the contract documents and the pleadings, constructive eviction, invalid lease, the right to terminate early. Those are governed by the documents and the pleadings. Further discovery, and the trial court correctly noted this, would be unavailing to the appellants. No facts are going to be discovered. Everything was produced, but even if it wasn't, no facts would be discovered that would help them get over the hurdle of what the contract documents say on their face and what their pleadings say on their face. So the argument was unfounded, and the uh, trial court properly rejected that argument in granting summary judgment in our favor. And we ask, of course, respectfully, that the decision granting summary judgment be affirmed by this court. Thank you very much. Thank you. Your Honors, first, there was no allegation in the complaint that the lease was valid and enforceable, so we certainly couldn't have admitted to that in our answer. Um, and the fact that the parties participate in the lease for eight years, also not relevant, because that's the difference between void and void ab voidable on one hand and void ab initio on the other hand. If it was void ab initio, it cannot be waived, and the case law says that. Um, as far as the, the guarantee is concerned and whether Lawrence had the right to, to benefit from that guarantee, so again, there's no question that Lawrence had a right to terminate. In fact, it, it was a requirement that they terminate and vacate in order for this entire clause to come in. It was a condition precedent. The only question then is what amount had to be paid at that point, and, and the document answers that question. It says if it's within five years and four months, there's a $66,000 termination fee plus payment to the surrender date. After the five years and four months, it's just payment to the surrender date. And their witness, who's a seasoned real estate attorney, was asked these questions at her deposition, and she said the same thing. Thank you very much. Thank you, Your Honors. Next case is People versus Saldana. Good afternoon, Your Honors. On behalf of Joseph Saldana, Molly Schindler, may it please the court. Mr. Saldana does not present the highest risk of sexual recidivism that would warrant a SORA level three. The mitigating information that was presented at the SORA hearing 
outweighed even what was an indisputably a heinous offense to demonstrate that the REI result overstated Mr. Saldana's risk of recidivism. His arrest for the instant offense here presented exactly the kind of intervention that Mr. Saldana needed and prompted him to finally take advantage of the opportunity to rehabilitate and accept the help that he needed. The record from the SORA hearing is replete with evidence of him accepting that help, pursuing the resources that he needed that would allow him to heal, rehabilitate, and stay on the right track going forward. This was motivated in part by the profound and exceptional remorse that he has consistently felt and expressed for his conduct in this offense. On that point, I'd ask your honors to review the statement that he made to the SORA court directly. It's, it's laid out on pages five and six of our opening brief because the statement that he made at the SORA hearing is unusual in both its length, it spanned approximately six pages of the record, but also its depth and the degree of introspection and maturity that he demonstrated in that statement. The remorse he expressed is consistent with what he has shared with his defense attorneys long before he pled guilty in this case. Um, but the, his goals and access to resources and the change in his mindset um, from the time of the offense are apparent from the statement and consistent with the evidence here of his access to rehabilitative programming and his ability to take advantage of the option to have a support network to enhance his own support network by developing and maintaining unusually strong relationships with the resources that he had from his institutional defenders. Even while he was in state prison, he was still maintaining that relationship, which allowed him to be far better set up than the average individual at the time of his reentry. Um, and those, those individuals contributed to his SOAR hearing by presenting a letter to the court about the changes that they'd noticed in him, the ability that they would have to support him when he came forward. All of those factors are not adequately accounted for by the risk assessment instrument, and they are a basis for departure. So we are asking your honors to exercise your independent discretion to downwardly depart. Thank you. May it please the court, cheer a night for the people. Here the court properly found defendant to be a level three sexually, sexually violent offender. The mitigating factors cited by defendant were all accounted for in the RAI. They certainly were not of a kind or degree that would warrant a downward departure. Regardless- Was, speech, was his speech to the SOAR court of such a different nature that we should consider it? as a factor requiring a decrease in SORA level? No, I don't believe so. And I believe the court also found this claim of like profound remorse dubious. He had a chance to apologize to his victim when it would be most meaningful to her. She gave this very impassioned, heart-wrenching plea to the court during his sentencing, and this defendant said nothing. And he's claiming that he had this remorse from before he pled guilty. And it's not this whole, he didn't understand the degree that he harmed her. That doesn't make any sense. Did you harm someone? Do you feel remorse? If you do, you apologize. He molested this, his stepdaughter from the age of seven to 13. And he can't understand that he did her harm? Enough to apologize at sentencing? And, and the court wasn't convinced either. And there's other parts of his speech where you can see where he kind of presumably drops things in to, to garner the court's sympathy um, as far as his childhood abuse. These were unnecessary things to mention. And it did actually hurt him when he mentioned all these um, restrictions that parole was going to, you know, to give him, and that was going to prevent his successful reentry, that troubled the court. The court, you know, is concerned when a defendant says that doc supervision is actually going to hinder their reentry effort instead of helping it, which is part of what it's there to do. In any event, um, the seriousness of this offense, his criminal history, and the 15 plus 
age disparity between defendant and the victim clearly outweigh any mitigating circumstance that defendant may argue. Also, the goal of SOAR is to analyze both the offender's likelihood of reoffense and the harm that would be inflicted if he did reoffend. Considering that he repeatedly molested this young girl for six years, the degree of harm is great in this case. And lastly, I just want to point out one thing. Level three requirements do offer additional protection to the community. A level three offender must report in person for verification every 90 days, as opposed to twice a year for level two offenders. This allows the public to be fully aware, at least to the degree permitted by law, of whether defendant is compliant with SARA housing. Also, a level three offender must have his photo taken every year, as opposed to three years for a level two, and should the offender change his appearance, the officer is permitted to take his photograph at any time. And lastly, this defendant can always apply for a modification with this court. Once he's out at liberty, and if he can show this court that he has done all these things, these wonderful things that he has promised to do, he can always come back and apply for modification. Thank you very much. Thank you. With respect to the requirements of a level three registrant, Mr. Saldana will be on post-release supervision. That is an intensive form of supervision for people who are on the registry, not regular parole, for the next 10 years. So the reporting requirement of going into the registration office every 90 days is vastly superseded by the reporting requirements that he will have on parole, rendering that distinction less relevant to someone in Mr. Saldana's circumstances. In yeah, other words, I was, the- I, was, uh, I thought upon reading the SOAR court's decision that, that the judge really took the responsibility seriously to engage in the Galati three-step inquiry, and particularly with respect to that third step, the all-important discretionary weighing of the, uh, the mitigating factors on the one hand and the aggravating circumstance on the other. And in light of the, the fact the judge took that responsibility very seriously and, and, and really thoroughly set out his rationale for why a departure wasn't acceptable in his view, uh, why isn't that entitled to some measure of deference from us? Your Honor, may I respond? I see that my time is up. Go ahead. Just briefly, Your Honor, um, this court, because this is a de novo review in the interest of your uh, this court's independent discretion, no deference is warranted to that judgment, and we do submit that for the reasons we stated in our brief that it was incorrect. Thank you. Thank you. Melendez versus Alliance Housing. May it please the court. My name is Patrick Steinbauer. I represent the appellants in this action, the Alliance Housing uh, Defendants and Park Management. <clears throat> so this case involves a slip and fall in a stairway in a residential building. Plaintiff uh, alleges that she fell due to a loose piece of tile on the third floor landing of stairwell A in that building. <clears throat> there there's no uh, issue in terms of actual notice. There was no complaints in regards to uh, that piece of loose tile that uh, she says caused her to fall. She never made a complaint in regards to that piece of tile and to any tile Why on that. Did she create an issue of fact, though, based on her testimony? Assuming that you, your client made a prima facie based on her testimony that that condition had existed for six months, that she felt a piece of tile under her foot when she slipped, she saw the loose tile. Um, why isn't that enough to create an issue of fact as to constructive notice? Um, well, in terms of the uh, six months, that the condition of seeing loose tiles on that landing during the six-month period, um, that there we have the, the clear um, testimony of Mr. Uh, Mr. Nelson, the security guard, who who inspected that landing. 30 minutes before Why our accident. Why doesn't that just raise an issue of fact? Obviously, their testimony contradicts each other. One is saying something different than the other. Isn't that the classic issue of fact to be determined by a jury? 
Well, the plaintiff in this case uh, admitted that she never looked at the landing on the day of her accident. The moment of her accident, but she said she felt the tile and she looked down and she saw she slipped on a loose tile. Oh. So she did say she saw she, the tile the day of her accident. Right, in a post in a post, uh, af, post deposition affidavit, she says she could feel a tile under her right foot. She never tells us how she can distinguish or identify a flat piece of tile under her right foot. It, 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 you can say, I felt something under your right foot. So how counsel, can she identify? So counsel, that's a specific. When I, I have, when I looked at um, the photographs, um, the photographs showed linoleum over tile and, and there was a uh, missing list linoleum. But, but Mr. Nelson, the security officer for defendants said that the floors are all cement. So just that alone, don't you think raises a, an issue of tribal fact that has to be determined by a jury as to just what happened here? Well, he's answering that question in, 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 in uh, the midst of a, a long deposition, and he, and basically the cement, the steps are cement. And he's asked that question separately from what he saw on the date of the accident. The date of the accident, he said, he didn't see any broken tiles or loose pieces on the third floor landing. But he also he goes through and testified at that deposition that the landing was smooth cement, which is clearly contradicted by the photographs at pages 323 and 325. He may have made a mistake on that. Well, that's a pretty big mistake, though, doesn't that? It's, Isn't that it's a not, great significance? It's not. If he's focused, you're talking about what's the landing made of, as opposed to is he seeing loose pieces of tile on the landing? The ste cement. The steps are cement. So he, his testimony is, I didn't see anything loose or dangerous on that landing. He makes a mistake, or he gets it wrong in terms of saying that landing is concrete. That's that's not the same thing. He's, it's not the testimony of what what's that landing made of. It's whether or not there was any loose pieces on that landing prior to plaintiff's uh, fall. Well, as Justice Curran pointed out a few minutes ago, I think, I mean, it's almost like a tale of two landings. The, uh, Mr. <laughs> Nelson had one very distinct view that would be certainly support of a finding of, of, of no liability, and then the plaintiff gave a much different view of the, the condition of the, the landing, which would tend to support her, her liability claims. And which and was how, supported by the photograph. And, you know, how are we to decide which narrative is, is the accurate one? But if you look on just the day of the accident, what was she able to see in terms of that landing? She didn't see anything because she didn't look at it. And in terms of what the landing consisted of in terms of other pieces on the landing, she couldn't feel that with her, other, her right foot. But she didn't counsel, walk all over that there, landing. Aren't and there credibility the right issues that could only oh, sorry, be... Your Honor. Aren't there credibility issues that could only be decided by a jury? So, for example, if Mr. Nelson says that he conducted hourly inspections and he never saw that, according to his logbook, that there were broken or loose tiles on the floor, and then he also says, and the floor was made of cement, aren't there credibility issues there as to whether there was an open and notorious condition, whether the condition was created by the landlord, whether the you condition answer, speaks counsel. for itself. I mean, aren't, doesn't this have to be figured out by a jury? I don't think a jury could, it, it's two different issues. Does he know the um, makeup or the consistency of each of those landings in terms of is it linoleum, is it concrete, as opposed to what did he see on the date of the accident? He's clearly saying, he didn't see any broken tiles or missing, or broken tiles were loose pieces thank, on that landing. Thank you, counsel. Thank you. Good afternoon. <clears throat> May it please the court. I am Brett Upart. I represent the plaintiff respondent, Francesca Melendez, in this matter. As we just heard, on the argument by appellant that there are just two incompatible fact patterns here that must be resolved by a fact finder. A plaintiff testifies about her fall, about her slip and fall on a condition that was ongoing for up to for at least six months. Prior to the day of her accident, she had testified that she had 
use that landing on an approximate every other day basis. And during that six months, the two levels of tile had missing tiles, broken tiles, and this floor that now has uh, a surface of many different levels has the broken off tiles littered on top of them. This has been going on for six months. There's no issue of notice. This is an ongoing condition. Well, sir, what about your friend's uh, argument that uh, plaintiff didn't see the, the tile at the moment she fell or, or right before she fell, and so how do we know that um, she slipped on a loose tile? Well, at the moment she fell or right at the time, her testimony was that she wasn't paying attention and who would pay requisite precise attention? They would avoid the fall otherwise. But she did then see, feel the tile, experience the tile, slips on it, falls down the tile, falls down the steps with her. She sees it. She crawls back up the steps because there's no one there to help her. And she shattered her ankle. She crawls back up to that landing because that's where her apartment is. And when asked at her deposition by counsel right here, where were the tiles missing? She was able to show on the date of the accident, she was able to show where the tiles were missing on the date of the accident. That's page 216 of the record. They were asked her where these missing tiles were then littered. She was able to say that they were, say that on the date of the accident they were scattered. That was page 218. By the way, crawling back up from the fall, that's page 175. And the six months using the landing every other day, that's page 164 and 165. If you would, <clears throat> the defendants want you to believe that this is a one-off transient condition case. It's not. This is a deteriorating, <clears throat> pardon me, ongoing condition for six months. As already pointed out, Mr. Nelson, he doesn't see broken or missing tile because to him, there is no tile at all. He testifies several different times that there is, that the floor is made of cement and not tile. On page 673, he's asked, what was the floor made of? The floor is made of regular cemented floor. This is talking about the landing at the third floor. A cemented floor, yes. A smooth floor like a sidewalk type, yes. Page 674, it's a cement floor, yes. Question, are there any tiles on the floor? No. Page 675, the landing on the stairwells, those are just smooth cement, yes. Now is this true back in March of 2016? Yes. The accident occurred in March of 2016. So the defendant is trying to make a big deal of Mr. Nelson allegedly not seeing any broken or missing tile, but Mr. Nelson doesn't see any tile because he just thinks it's a cement floor. Thank you very much. Thank you. The key problem with uh, what the uh, counselor just said is that he says that the plaintiff saw loose tile on the landing on the date of her accident, and she clearly admitted she never looked at the landing. So she's going based on her memory of what she saw prior, on prior days, not on the date of her accident. And that's the key thing here. Was there a dangerous condition on the landing on the date of her accident? She can't prove that. Mr. Nelson, who walks on those steps out every hour, can say clearly there was no dangerous condition on that landing. And to go into what he remembers in terms of the, the base of the floor, what the floor consisted of, gets away from the main issue in terms of notice. Also, this dangerous condition that, he ta that the counselor talks about, there's no complaints to the management, no complaints made by plaintiff. Plaintiff walks across this floor daily. She lives in 3G. She never has any complaints of slipping, any problems to management in terms of all these loose tiles that are on the landing. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you.